Greetings, imagination connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, Robert Meyer Burnett. And I invite you to watch and listen to the Designing Hollywood podcast, brought to you by Martika Abera and the great, legendary Hollywood costume designer, Marilyn Vance. I am afforded the wonderful opportunity of co-hosting the show. If you are interested in the magic of Hollywood, the design of Hollywood, the clothes of Hollywood, watch the Designing Hollywood podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts from, or find the video version on the John Campia YouTube channel. That's right, the Designing Hollywood podcast. Why would you ever want to miss it, especially if you love the movies? Observations with Robert Meyer Burnett. I've heard it said before, like, it was a very smart man named uh, Robert Meyer Burnett who said, the currency of our current age is authenticity. And it's so true. Unlimited, in association with Road to Perdition author Max Allen Collins, brings you the upcoming audio drama True Noir, the Nathan Heller Casebooks, based on the 19 novel series by Max Allen Collins, starring Captain Shaw from Picard Season 3's Todd Stashwick as the titular Nathan Heller. Once a Chicago PD officer turned private eye to the stars. Coming soon to a crowdfunding campaign near you. Greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your master of fun and wonder, your viceroy of verisimilitude, your sommelier and sci -fi, of, of sci-fi and cinema, your evangelist of the imagination and the perhaps never-to-be-defined existential Mr. Rogers. That's right. Me, Robert Meyer Burnett, and I'm Rob casting at you, you imagination connoisseurs, you members of this, the Post Geek Singularity community. This is actually Rob Observations episode number 929. You know, sometimes I like to talk about books. I read a lot of books. You know, it's not exactly the greatest fare for YouTube because, you know, I don't know if people are reading as many books as they used to, but that doesn't matter. There are some books that are just so seminal to our lives as imagination connoisseurs that we got to talk about them. And uh, this is one of those times. It also, the book in question, led to one of the greatest movies ever made by one of our finest directors, Steven Spielberg. And I'm, of course, talking about Jaws. That's right, Jaws. Written by Peter Benchley, the novel Tomorrow is its 50th anniversary of its publication. February 1st, 1974 is when Peter Benchley's Jaws came out. Here's what the first edition hardcover looked like. You know, uh, Roger Castell had not painted the iconic image that was used for the movie poster and the paperback release of Jaws, which was this. So we all know the famous Roger Castell poster. Now, why should you all, why should you imagination connoisseurs know who Roger Costell is? Not only was he a great artist, but he also painted one of my favorite movie posters of all time. Not just Jaws, but he also painted the Empire Strikes Back one sheet. That's right. It's known as the Gone with the Wind poster because it emulates the Rhett and Scarlet image from the Gone with the Wind key art. This is one of my favorite movie posters of all time. The Star Wars saga continues. I mean, my God, is this a poster? And you know what? The movie lived up to this. When you look, I always believed that a great key art, key art's what they call in the movie business or in the biz, uh, like your main art. Your main, It's the key. It's sort of as your anchor. It's the key art that they're going to use to promote the film. I always thought that a great piece of key art uh, should mythologize the whole movie that you're about to see. So if you have a great piece of key art, by looking at the key art, it should evoke in you a feeling of what the entire movie would feel like to watch. And I feel that this poster, 
Roger Castell's poster for The Empire Strikes Back is absolutely one of those posters. Now, you know, people remember the the B sheet with uh, Darth Vader going like this, and it's more light blue and snowy. That was cool, but it wasn't as cool. And before I get into the book, I just want to give a shout out to Roger Castell. Roger Castell, the artist, passed away uh, last year. He was 92 years old, and he died on last November 8th of kidney and heart failure. He was in a hospice facility in Worcester, Massachusetts, and his wife of 66 years, Grace, was there and told The Hollywood Reporter. He also did posters for Dr. Faustus, starring Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor, and The Great Train Robbery, starring Sean Connery. And, of course, Jaws was published by Doubleday in 1974. And um, the hardcover art, this art was by a man named Paul Bacon. And uh, Roger Castell obviously came on board and Peyton. I mean, this might be one of the greatest pieces of key art. His poster for Jaws is one of the greatest pieces of key art in cinema history. I mean, uh, what more needs to be said? In terms of mythologizing the movie that you're about to see, um, truly. And uh, Castell tweaked uh, the image, but he made the shark. It, it's really interesting. Um, his oil painting would be, it was employed by the paperback edition for Bantam Books. But um, he visited the American Museum of Natural History to photograph fish there. And um, Roger Castell said, do you have a shark exhibit in the building? But they were all down, and uh, he was in the documentary, The Shark is Still Working. And so, um, yeah. And for his female swimmer, Roger Castell asked the model he was photographing at a good housekeeping shoot to stick around for a bit longer. He got her to approximate the front crawl while on a stool. He also removed the bathing suit that the swimmer had worn on the hardcover version and got the book banned in several cities. (laughs) So there you go. Um, Come on. You got to love it. But interestingly enough, um, you know, I came across the 70s. When you think about a lot of people talk about Jaws as being one of the first big summer blockbusters um, on record, you know, changing Hollywood and all that. But I I would go so far as to say that it was the culmination of a trend that had already begun in the early part of the 70s. And famously, if you if you know about um, uh, Paramount Pictures and you know about Robert Evans, l- let me tell you about Charlie B- Bloodhorn. Uh, yeah, I mean, I love Robert Evans. If you have not watched Matthew Good as Robert Evans in, uh, what is it, The Deal? What was it called? <laughs> you know, the thing about the making of The Godfather. Um, and it, it was, he, I, that performance, how he did not get, he, they should just give him, uh, an Emmy Award. And by the way, everybody, Paramount Plus people, um, somebody should have Matthew Good play Robert Evans and and do a dramatized version of The Kid Stays in the Picture. Do the whole effing book and just have Matthew Good uh, play it because he was so good. I mean, I, look, I've always, he was great in A Single Man, but that performance was indelible. But so anyway, Robert Evans would famously do things like he was developing books along with authors like Love Story uh, and The Godfather. And if you think about other huge books uh, of the 70s, early 70s, obviously Anthony Burgess is A Clockwork Orange, Kubrick Adapted, um, Logan's Run was was an adaptation of uh, William F. Nolan and George Clayton Johnson's novel. And then, of course, The Exorcist, you know, uh, was another huge book. And even Airport, was, was it Arthur Haley? I think it was Arthur Haley wrote Airport. Airport was an airport read. And and all of these books in the 70s, even when I was a kid, I knew they weren't high art. I mean, I knew they were kind of, they weren't sketchy, but they were, they were populist novels. And look, I am a huge lover of airport reading. You go in and you buy, either it's a big bestseller or you go to the airport bookstore. I love airport bookstores. You know, I go in there, I'll get my water, I'll get my gum to chew for when we land. I'll get, I just like getting snacks. And then you gotta, if you didn't bring a book with you, which I usually do, but if I don't, then I go get a book and I like to read, you know, where, wherever I'm going. Reading on an airplane is one of my favorite things to do in the world. 
and I love I love transcontinental flights, transatlantic flights, whatever, or trans Pacific flights. When I used to go to New Zealand and Australia all the time, and when I said all the time, I mean it was like one or two trips a month for a couple of years. Uh, it was great. I loved it, but I loved reading. But airport reads, good airport reading. I mean, what is my definition of like a list airport reading? Like Gillian Flynn's Gone Girl. Even though I didn't read that on an airplane, I read that at home. That was like a one sitting book. Or Andy Weir's recent Project Hail Mary. Beautiful, great book. Loved it. Really good populist science fiction. Read it in one sitting. That's the kind of shit I love. But these books in the 70s that Hollywood was making, like The Exorcist. I mean, The Exorcist, I don't know if you'd call that an airport read, but, you know, definitely <laughs> it was, it was, uh, went for the gut jugular. But The Exorcist, Love Story, Jaws, these were all books, uh, Godfather, they were populist novels that um, that that people were reading and then they got turned into very successful films. And yet Jaws is usually considered to be the first blockbuster, but I would say, uh, the first summer blockbuster, but I would say Godfather was a blockbuster. Exorcist was a blockbuster, you know? I mean, One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest was uh, uh, a novel, but I, I don't know if you'd call that an airport read. I think it, it also had different kinds of aspirations. But books, books, populist novels were great fodder to be turned into populist uh, Hollywood films. And I don't know if that happens as much anymore. I mean, we still certainly get book adaptations, but I don't know if books become the kind of populist all the rage to read the way they did in the 70s. Or maybe I'm looking at it through rose-colored glasses. I don't know what the anal analytics are. But, like, you know, I was one of these kids, like, I would read the New York Times book review, I wouldn't read all the book reviews, but, you know, I, there was usually something that would turn me on. And I, you know, I, I haunt good reads and things like that. I'm always looking for books to read, but I don't, I don't know. I think that, I, I mean, I, you know, I, I guess I can say that's not true, that I, there's still always great books to read. There's always bangers out there. And um, I don't know if Hollywood just goes to them. Like, I still don't understand why Donna Tartt's The Secret History um has not been turned into a movie that Steve Zalian writes and David Fincher directs or whatever, the equivalent. Don't understand it. I know after the Goldfinch, with, which tanked, it probably killed the secret history's potential to become, you know, there are two books. Like, th this is going to seem so weird and off the wall for this, but if you haven't read Donna Tartt's The Secret History, you've got to read it. You've got to read it. Um, and there's a book by Robert Goddard called In Pale Battalions. In Pale Battalions. It's a period piece. I love this book. I think about this book all the time. Not as many times as I think about the Roman Empire, but I think about it a lot. And it, it was it was really, really good. Uh, and also, I'm still one of those people that thinks that they should remake Less Than Zero or maybe keep Rules of Attraction and remake Less Than Zero. Where is the Brett Easton Ellis verse? You know, because his books are all interlinked. I mean, we got Rules of Attraction. We have, what, The Informers? We have Less Than Zero, we have American Psycho, Glamorama, and now The Shards. I mean, where's the where's the Brett Easton Ellis verse? As a matter of fact, why don't they just buy all Brett Easton Ellis' books and make them all this interconnected, the Ellis verse? I don't know, too off topic? Maybe. Uh, anyway, let's get back to Jaws. I found this great article today. Uh, on Quillette, of all places, and uh, there is an article about the 50th anniversary of Peter Benchley's Jaws, and I was reading it, I'm like, this is great, and I was halfway through this article, and I thought to myself, fuck man, I'm going to share this tonight on Observations. why? Because it's my show, and it's the 50th anniversary of the release of the novel Jaws, so let's, which by the way, I read, and you know, Jaws and Hank Searle's Jaws 2, uh, which has nothing to do with the movie. But uh, I, you know, Jaws is very different. Hooper has an affair with with Ellen Brod or Ellen uh, Brody, uh, you know, which I didn't like. I think I think the movie is a better book or a better movie. Uh, the movie of Jaws is better than the book. I'll say that right now. But I want to delve into this article. Uh, let's check it out. And the article is called "Here Comes the Bite," and it's written by Kevin Mims. Again, this was on Quillette. I did put the link to this article down in the description right above the tip link. So 
right below. Either way, you can find it right in the description if you want to follow along at home, kids. So here's the article. And, and by the way, of course, we know that Jaws came out in 1975, so a year later. Kevin Mims wrote this, uh, and it was published today. Next year, when Steven Spielberg's 1975 movie Jaws celebrates his 50th anniversary, it will no doubt be hailed as the film that invented the summer blockbuster. The first classic to be directed by a baby boomer, the first movie to be largely shot on the ocean, and the first in which the musical score was practically a major character. It significantly altered the way that Hollywood would henceforth promote films, heavy TV advertising, will give him Jaws. Percy Rodriguez from the first season of Star Trek, who who played uh, uh, a Commodore, the head of a Starfleet, uh, head of a star, star Base in the Star Trek episode Court Martial. Uh, his voiceover, he's a very handsome guy, but his voiceover to Jaws, this trailer's a banger. Anyway, it caused studios to seek out numerous similar projects, high concept action films that often included non-human monsters. But before Jaws became forever associated with Spielberg, it was a hugely successful novel written by Peter Benchley. Nowadays, the film is still highly regarded, while the novel, if not forgotten, is no longer much appreciated. The novel was published on February 1st, 1974, although its 50th birthday party isn't likely to be terribly extravagant, but it is here on the Burnett work. Benchley died in 2006 at the age of 65, and his cultural footprint is nowhere near as large as Spielberg's. His biography is also quite different. Spielberg is a Jew who grew up primarily in Phoenix, Arizona, a mediocre student. He dropped out of Cal State Long Beach in the late 1960s and rapidly established a reputation as a cinematic wunderkind. In 1968, when he was only 21 years old, he signed a seven-year contract to work as a director for Universal Studios. Benchley was born in 1940, six years before Spielberg, and he came from a New England family that had been in America since its days as a British colony. His ancestors were largely members of the so-called Frozen Chosen, stiff-necked wasps who were prominent in government, business, and society. Benchley's great-great-grandfather, Henry, we Henry, Henry Weatherby Benchley, 1822-67, served as lieutenant governor of Massachusetts and helped to establish the Republican Party. Peter's grandfather was Robert Benchley, a co-founder along with friends such as Dorothy Parker and George S. Kaufman of the famous Algonquin Roundtable, the ballad of Dorothy Parker. Uh, Robert Benchley became one of the New Yorkers, actually a different woman, uh, New Yorkers' first breakout stars, publishing roughly a column a week for the magazine throughout the 1930s. Peter's father, Nathaniel Benchley, was also a successful writer and penned everything from naval thrillers to children's books. His 1961 novel, The Off-Islanders, was adapted by Norman Jewison into the hit 1966 film, The Russians Are Coming, The Russians Are Coming, which, by the way, Kino Lorber is putting out on uh, disc this week, I think, and um, Norman Jewison just passed away a couple weeks ago. Uh, by the way, he also directed And Justice for All and Rollerball and lots of other great movies, so check out Norman Jewison. Uh, it was the sixth highest grossing film of the year and was nominated for a Best Picture Academy Award. Like his father and grandfather before him, Peter Benchley matriculated at the exclusive prep school Phillips Exeter Academy and at Harvard University. My grandfather went to Phillips Exeter and tried to make me go, but I should have gone, but I didn't because I'm like, there's no way I'm going to some weird East Coast prep school. I lived in Seattle. Uh, he was blessed with good connections, and these were certainly useful to a degree. They provided the young writer with name recognition and helped him to obtain an agent at International Famous Agency, which also represented his father. In his 2002 nonfiction book, Shark Trouble, Benchley notes, I was very fortunate to have an agent. As a favor to my father, one of his agents, a kindly and generous woman named Roberta Pryor, had taken me on when I was 16 and had... Uh, Miserable Dictu, actually a short story of mine when I was 20. I received one fan letter from a woman who pronounced the story the single most execrable piece of rubbish, rubbish she'd ever read. That parenthetical is typical of Benchley. Bestseller lists of the 1970s were full of writers who tended to boast about their own brilliance. Eric Siegel, Leon Uris, Harold Robbins, Richard Bach. All these people had movies of their books, by the way, but Benchley wasn't one of them. Besides, the caricature of Peter Benchley as a Nepo baby has never been entirely fair, as he lacked neither talent nor dedication. 
His widow, Wendy, to whom Jaws would be dedicated, has provided an introduction to the Folio Society's new 50th anniversary edition, in which she wrote, When he was 15 and 16, Peter undertook a challenge set by his father to commit to writing four hours a day during the summer. He could either sit alone in his small room each day staring at the typewriter keyboard or produce a thousand words. His father knew that being a full-time writer was a tough life, so he wanted to test Peter's desire and determination for the craft. He expected that a rambunctious, athletic teenager would tire of the solitude and soon opt for more stimulating pursuits. Peter not only tolerated the discipline and isolation instilled in him by his father, he enjoyed them. At the age of 17, he began writing stories and sending them to magazines. He had all the qualities essential for a novelist, an intense curiosity, a superb imagination, and the ability to always ask, what if? He read about nautical history, underwater archaeology, marine biology, the succession of English and Spanish monarchs, great 18th and 19th century writers, and of course, sharks and other marine life. Years later, when the opportunity arose to talk to a publisher about a potential novel, he was ready not only to write a couple of plot ideas, but with the tools to create the story and the characters necessary for a gripping yarn. Benchley's first book, a travel memoir titled Time and a Ticket, was published in 1964 and immediately vanished into obscurity. It sold out its entire 5,000 copy first and only edition, but he claims this was because his grandmother bought most of them. For a while, he wrote obituaries for the Washington Post, and his first article about sharks appeared in Newsweek in 1965. In 1967, he became a speechwriter for President Lyndon Baines Johnson, a gig that ended abruptly when Johnson opted not to run for re-election in 1968. By the early 1970s, Benchley and his wife and their two young children were living in a house in Pennington, New Jersey. For $50 a month, he rented a small office space above a furnace supply company where he did most of his writing. The 1970s were a financially unfriendly decade, and even many Harvard graduates had to struggle to make a living. At this point, he was scraping by doing freelance writing for the National Geographic and other magazines. Fortunately, his agent believed in his talent. In Shark Trouble, he writes, Roberta refused to give up on me and encouraged me to have lunch with editors from publishing houses, a ritual that proved countless writers with vitally necessary meals and encouragement, and now and then even generated a viable book idea. I kept two arrows in my quiver expressly for these lunches. One was a nonfiction idea about pirates, as in a history of. The other idea was for a fictional story about a great white shark that lays siege to a resort community. Folded in my wallet was a yellowed 1964 clipping from the New York Daily News that reported the capture of a 4,550-pound great white shark off Long Island. I would brandish it at the first hint of disbelief that such an animal could exist, let alone that it might attack boats and eat people. The protagonist of that news story was Frank Mundus, 1925 to 2008, a charter boat captain who led what he called monster fishing expeditions out of Long Island for many years. Mundus is thought to have been the model for the cantankerous, shark-hating sea captain Quint, one of the main characters in Jaws, played by Robert Shaw in the film. Benchley's break arrived when he was invited by lunch uh, by Tom Congdon, who was then a senior editor at Doubleday a major American publishing house. On June 14th, 1971, the two men met at a restaurant called Close Normand over a seafood meal. Or is it Claw? Claw? Uh, like Claw Dubois? Uh, uh, over a seafood meal appropriately, Benchley pinched, uh, pitched his two ideas. Congdon was lukewarm about the pirate idea, but told him to go home and write up a one-page synopsis of the shark idea for consideration by Doubleday's editorial board. A lengthy and deeply researched 1974 New York Times story by Ted Morgan provides us with the most comprehensive account of how that speculative lunch produced one of the most popular novels of the decade. On June 23rd, Benchley's one-page description arrived. The purpose of the novel, he wrote, would be to explore the reactions of a community that was suddenly struck by a peculiar natural disaster, not an earthquake or a flood, but a continuing mysterious devastation that, as time goes on, loses its natural neutrality and begins to smack of evil. Suppose a Long Island resort community was suddenly visited by a great white shark. A young woman is killed. 
How does the community cope with this inexplicable menace? Morgan reports that the editorial board liked the idea and offered Benchley $1,000 to write up the first four chapters. If Doubleday liked them, he would be permitted to continue and eventually receive an additional $6,500 upon the novel's completion. But if Doubleday didn't like the first four chapters, the project would be abandoned and Benchley would be expected to return half the advance, keeping the rest for himself, minus the 10% his agent would receive. However, Roberta Pryor balked. She didn't believe that her client should have to return any of his $1,000 advance if Doubleday passed on the book, and this dispute nearly sank the project before it was launched. Doubleday argued that allowing authors to keep the entire advance on books the company ultimately decided not to pursue would set a dangerous precedent, but Pryor was adamant. For me, it was the principle of the thing, she told Morgan. Are they in the risk business or not? You want the publisher's vote of confidence, not the money on a yo-yo? Jaws would eventually become a multi-million dollar entertainment industry juggernaut. But for several weeks, in 1971, the entire project hung in limbo over a mere $500. Fortunately, Doubleday finally relented. Benchley was told that he could keep the entire $1,000 if he turned in the first four chapters by April 15, 1972. On March 20th, 1972, 25 days ahead of his deadline, Benchley turned in the first 174 pages of a manuscript with the working title, A Stillness in the Water. The opening chapter read pretty much as it would eventually appear in the published novel. A pretty young woman takes a midnight swim in the waters off Long Island and is killed by a massive shark. Much of the chapter is told from the shark's point of view and elaborated with scientific explanations of how sharks hunt and feed, which gave the killing a cold and clinical quality at odds with the horrific human tragedy it described. Doubleday loved it. Alas, the next three chapters were not at all what they were expecting. Benchley's father and grandfather were satirists and wrote primarily in a comic vein. Nathaniel Benchley's The Off-Islanders dealt with a Cold War confrontation between a New England fishing village and the Soviet submarine crew that washes up on its shores, but it was more interested in providing humorous social commentary on the subsequent culture clash than delivering thrills and chills. His son seems to have taken a somewhat similar approach in the first 174 pages of his shark novel. A funny thriller about a shark eating people is, I soon realized, a perfect oxymoron, Benchley wrote in Shark Trouble. To his credit, Benchley never bridled at the many editorial suggestions and rewrite requests that came to him via Congdon or from the book's co-editor, Kate Medina. As he later explained to Morgan, when they insisted, I gave in. They'd been in the business a long time and I'd never written a novel. At this point in his career, Benchley still thought of himself as a non-fiction writer. The Shark book was written out of financial necessity. This isn't to suggest that Jaws is a piece of hack work. It isn't. Benchley obviously took a great deal of care with the novel. His willingness to repeatedly alter the course of his book at the best of his editors seems less like the behavior of a literary hack than a survival strategy for a 30-something family man struggling to pay his bills. It also suggests a degree of humility for which artists are not exactly famous. By April 28, 1972, Benchley had sufficiently amended the opening chapters for Congdon to formally offer him a publishing contract. On top of the $1,000 option, he would get $2,500 when he signed his contract, another $2,000 upon delivery of a first draft, and $2,000 more when the manuscript was accepted. That $7,500 may not sound like much now, but in inflation-adjusted dollars, it would come to roughly $55,000 today. That kind of money wouldn't turn the head of a contemporary best-selling author like Stephen King or John Grisham, but almost any first-time novelist would probably be thrilled. And as soon as paperback publishers and the movie studios began bidding on the rights for the novel, Benchley would find himself awash with cash. On January 2, 1973, Benchley finally turned in his completed manuscript. Congdon and Doubleday were delighted, which is hardly surprising given their extensive editorial input. Nonetheless, it was Benchley's novel. The story was his own original idea, and his keen interest in sharks infused the novel with awe and terror. The only thing that Congdon didn't like about Benchley's book was the title. 
A stillness in the water, he told Morgan, sounded like a Francois Sagan novel about a young woman who goes to the Riviera to forget about an unhappy love affair. According to Congdon, a total of 237 titles were suggested and shot down. Days before the book was scheduled to go to the printers, Congdon and Benchley met for lunch in New York to try and settle the issue. As he recalls in Shark Trouble, Finally, when we had finished lunch and Tom had paid the check, I said, Look, there's no way we're going to agree on a title. There's only one word we agree on. So let's make that the title. Let's call it Jaws. They still had a few problems to solve, however. Originally, Benchley had wanted the cover of the book to feature a bucolic Long Island beach town framed by the shark's jagged teeth. A mock-up of the cover was made, but Doubleday's sales force, the men who would fan out across the country and try and sell the book to American bookstores, objected that it reminded them of Vagina Dentata. Congdon asked his art director if the cover could simply contain a shark rising toward the surface of the sea. His art director vetoed the idea, telling Congdon that telling Congdon that the cover wasn't big enough and that the fish would look like a sardine. At this point, Doubleday turned to legendary book cover artist Paul Bacon. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, let me just throw this up here while I read this. Uh, legendary book cover artist Paul Bacon, who retained the rising fish motif but added a woman swimming on the surface of the water. This helped to illustrate the giant scale of the shark and also suggested the menace in the book's plot. Congdon told Morgan that everyone at Doubleday realized the new fish image looked like a penis with teeth, but the book now had a title, a cover, and was ready to be unleashed upon the American reading public. <laughs> uh, it does look like a penis with teeth, or a penis with a mouth, or just a penis in general, but hey, whatever works, right? While all this bickering over the artwork and the title was going on, Doubleday's subsidiary rights department was busy negotiating paperback publishing houses with paperback publishing houses and subscription services. The book was sold to the Book of the Month Club, a subscription service that mailed out cheaply made and discounted copies of newly published books to its tens of thousands of subscribers weeks before the public publication date of the regular hardback. Those subscribers could opt to either buy the book or send it back unread. A Book of the Month Club presale usually boded well for a new book's marketability. The book was also pre-sold to the Reader's Digest Condensed Book Club and to the Playboy Magazine Book Club, both of which were subscription services. These sales made the book profitable even before it hit the nation's bookstores, and the money they brought in was split with the author. In his Times profile, Morgan reports that Oscar Dreistel, the president of Bantam Books, a paperback imprint, was reading a pre-publication copy of the novel on a commuter train ride home from his office in New York City one evening and was mesmerized. He instructed Bantam editor Alan Bernard to offer Doubleday $200,000 for the paperback rights. That was a huge amount of money, but the executives at Doubleday were torn. They worried that if they turned down the offer, they might never get another one as good. But they also thought it was possible that if they shopped the book around, they might be able to get as much as $300,000. Eventually, they opted to put the book up for auction, but they offered Bantam the right to top the winning bid if it chose to do so. Bantam ended up securing the paperback rights for the curious but astounding figure of $575,009. <laughs> That's wild. Doubleday got half that money, and the other half went to the author. Roberta Pryor sold the film rights to producers David Brown and Richard D. Zanuck for $150,000. She secured Benchley another $25,000 for writing the script. Eventually, he would share screenwriting credit with Carl Gottlieb, who was brought in to do a dialogue polish on Benchley's script. Benchley noted Riley to Morgan that describing Gottlieb's rewrite as a dialogue polish was like, <laughs> quote, referring to gang rape as heavy necking. According to the Jaws Log, a nonfiction account of the Jaws phenomenon written by Carl Gottlieb, whose relationship with Benchley was cordial, 
despite the gang rape joke, Peter Benchley had just $600 in his bank account on the day the paperback sale to Bantam was finalized. On January 18, 1974, an article in Publishers Weekly noted that Peter Benchley has written a major novel, one that has created virtually unprecedented pre-publication excitement. Over $1 million in subsidiary rights sold, a 35,000 copy initial printing, a major ad promotion. By mid-March, Doubleday had printed up 75,000 copies and was selling roughly 8,000 a week. By today's standards, that might not seem like much, but the literary marketplace was very different back in 1974. For a start, the U.S. had 120 million fewer people. Furthermore, books were sold differently then. Nowadays, you can buy hardcover books at your local grocery store, national supermarket chains like Walmart, membership-only chains like Costco and Sam's Club, in airport gift shops, and of course, online. Back in 1974, almost all hardcover book sales in America took place in bookstores, and most of those stores were small, local, independent shops. Large chain bookstores such as B. Dalton's and Walden Books existed back then, but they didn't have anywhere near the reach they would eventually attain in the final decade of the 20th century, just prior to the advent of Amazon. So in order to buy a copy of Jaws in 1974, the consumer had to make a special trip to his local bookseller's shop. Hardbound books were marketed almost exclusively to those Americans who earned well above working class wages. Jaws was priced at $6.95 in 1974, the equivalent of nearly $45 today. John Grisham's latest hardback is currently selling for $19 at Amazon, marked down from the publisher's list price of $29.95. And hardback books were almost never discounted by the retailer back then. The evidence suggests that a lot of those early copies were purchased by people who are not regular bookstore customers. Television had much to do with this. Benchley was a tall, handsome, erudite, and witty individual. Doubleday recognized this and booked him on as many talk shows and morning news programs as possible. But Jaws was also one of the few novels of the era that was advertised on TV directly to the consumer. In the Jaws log, Gottlieb writes, The book refused to fade. Quite the contrary. Week after week, it kept on selling. And pretty soon, it became evident that Universal and Zanuck Brown had a substantial hit on their hands. It is estimated that the hardcore, hardcover book buyers in the country number around 60,000. These are the folks who want to read books when they're new. They make the best sellers. When they're through buying, it's usually time to hit the airports and the drugstores with the paperback version. But... Jaws showed signs of exceeding this basic upper limit, which indicated that the most delightful of prospects, people were buying the novel who didn't normally buy books. That meant a genuine grassroots movement toward the property. In bestsellers, popular fiction of the 1970s, scholar John Sutherland dedicated an entire chapter to Jaws. It begins, the term is often used loosely, but Jaws is a true, a true superseller of the 70s. In just six months, as a Bantam paperback, it sold over 6 million copies. And within a couple of years, had come up to the maximal 10 million mark. In Britain, Pan's paperback sold a million in its first year and almost twice as many as in its second, boosted by the film. I personally read the book after I saw the movie. Jaws had been in print for less than two years when Alex Payne Hackett and James Henry Burke published their survey of American book sales, 80 years of bestsellers, but it had already managed to become the seventh best-selling novel of the 20th century, behind only The Godfather, The Exorcist, To Kill a Mockingbird, Peyton Place, Love Story, and Valley of the Dolls, all of which had been in print for years before Jaws was published, and they were all made into movies. Those only familiar with the movie might be surprised to discover that, as Sutherland put it, the Jaws film and Jaws novel are significantly different. According to Spielberg, the final script contained 27 scenes that appear nowhere in Benchley's book. Most notably, Robert Shaw's monologue about the sinking of the USS Indianapolis during World War II. 
Benchley's book, on the other hand, contains several subplots that Spielberg opted not to use in his film. These changes resulted in a brief spat between Spielberg and his normally congenial writer. After Spielberg was quoted making some unflattering remarks about Benchley's novel in Newsweek, Benchley unwisely told a reporter from the LA Times, Wait and see. Spielberg will one day be known as the second, as the greatest second unit director in America. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that didn't age well. In the film, Mayor Larry Vaughn, who Murray Hamilton played, is presented as a reckless cynic who pressures police chief Brody to keep the beaches open for financial reasons. He worries that the small businesses of Amity will suffer if the shark is allowed to keep... By the way, Peter Benchley appears in Jaws. I don't know if this article is going to say that as a reporter on the beach. So he's actually in the movie. Uh... Amity will suffer if the shark is allowed to keep tourists from swimming off the shores of a small community. In the film, Amity is a New England town. In the book, it's situated in Long Island, New York. But in the book, Mayor Vaughn, for some reason his name is missing a second A in the film, is a more sympathetic figure who is coerced to keep the beaches open against his better judgment. Years earlier, when his wife was sick and he didn't have the money to pay for her medical treatment, Vaughn accepted a financial gift from a prominent Long Island mobster. That mobster has since made significant investments in Amity's real estate market and worries that the value of his holdings will plummet if Vaughn allows the beaches to close. The mob is also putting pressure on Chief Brody. At one point, a couple of goons drive up to Brody's house and murder the family cat in front of, his, in front of one of his children. This mafia subplot adds to Brody's woes. When he finds the dead cat in the garbage can, Benchley goes into full horror mode. Lying in a twisted heap atop a bag of garbage was Sean's cat, a big husky tom named Frisky. The cat's head had been twisted completely around. The yellow eyes overlooked its back. Yeesh! Couldn't put that in the movie. Can't do that to Sean. The book also includes a sexual affair between Ellen Brody and marine biologist Matt Hooper that never made it into Spielberg's film. In fact, Ellen's dissatisfaction with her life is a prominent subplot of the novel. She was raised in the East Coast's upper crust and educated at Miss Porter's School, an elite institution, the alumni of which include Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis and Gloria Vanderbilt, and at Wellesley though she dropped out after her junior year to marry Brody, who, five years older than she, was already a member of the Amity Police Department. As a child, she merely summered at Amity. Brody, on the other hand, was born and raised among Amity's working-class full-time residents. Now that she is married to a townie, Ellen's old friends tend to pity her and look down on her husband. This puts a lot of strain on the Brody's marriage, a subject that isn't given any consideration in the film at all. This is from the book, she hated her life, and she hated herself for hating it. She thought of a line from a song Billy, her son, played on the stereo. I'd trade all my tomorrows for a single yesterday. Would she make a deal like that? She wondered. But what good was there in wondering? Yesterdays were gone, spinning ever further away down a shaft that had no bottom. None of the richness, none of the delight could ever be retrieved. She walked across the street and climbed into her car. As she pulled out into the traffic, she saw Larry Vaughn standing on the corner. God, she thought, he looks as sad as I feel. <laughs> Another aspect of Benchley's novel that Spielberg mostly ignored concerned the economic struggles of the people of Amity. The 1970s were a decade marked by stagflation. After decades of growth, wages and union membership began to flatten as inflation began to rise. An oil embargo by OPEC caused a stratospheric surge in American gas prices. Martin Brody and the other residents of Amity are always worrying about money. Like the rest of the country, again, this is Benchley's novel. Like the rest of the country, Amity was feeling the effects of the recession. Like all their friends on tight fixed incomes, the Brodies shopped according to the supermarket specials. Monday's special was chicken, Tuesday's lamb, and so forth through the week. As each item was consumed, Ellen would note it on her list and replace it the next week. Thursday's special was hamburger, and Brody had seen enough chopped meat for one day. When a local fisherman named Bed Gardner is killed by the shark, the appearance of his corpse provides the first big jump scare in the film. By the way, when I saw that in the movie theater in 1975, 
That was the single scariest moment in anything I'd ever seen up to that point. I was eight, and it was awesome, and I loved it. Um, Brody's first concern for Gardner's widow, Sally. I worry about her, he tells Ellen. Have you ever talked to her about money, Ellen replies? replies. Never, but there can't be very much. I don't think her children have had any new clothes in a year, and she's always saying that she'd give anything to be able to afford meat more than once a week instead of having to eat the fish Ben catches. Will she get Social Security? All this talk about the cost of meat isn't accidental. For many families, meat became a luxury in the 1970s. A recent article in the New York Times has this to say about meat prices back then. The price of beef was so high by then, boycotts and protests were organized against grocery stores. In the opening sequence of the Mary Tyler Moore show, Mary Richards famously rolled her eyes at the label of a meat package before tossing it into her cart. By 1973, Curtis Mayfield sang in Future Shock about the price of meat higher than the dope in the streets. And President Richard M. Nixon had announced government price ceilings on beef. Joshua Speck, a professor of history at Notre Dame and the author of Red Meat Republic, recalls how meat prices affected the American family man in the 1970s. That is a time when there's a breakdown of a certain kind of manhood and a certain kind of economic man. There's a phase change in the economy and that coincides with a change in the place of the male breadwinner. To be a successful man is to eat steak. And that breaks down in the 1970s. Benchley would likely have understood this link between meat and manhood on a personal level. He was a married family man at the time, struggling to make a living. Spielberg, on the other hand, was a young, childless bachelor embarking on his third feature film for Universal. The fact that he chose to shoot his film on Martha's Vineyard, then is now one of the priciest housing markets in America, indicates that he wasn't all that interested in the lives of America's working stiffs. Benchley's novel is set in a specific location, Long Island, and the socioeconomic milieu, the working class, and time, the 70s. The film, like many of the movies that bear Spielberg's imprintur as a director or producer, E.T., Close Encounters, Poltergeist, The Goonies, Gremlins, etc., is set in a fantasy version of middle America where people seem to be more or less immune from the effects of economic strife. But that's not, I gotta object to you, this author, because that isn't true. Because you see the moment when Quint's introduced, but using his fingers on the chalkboard, <clears throat> they're all worried about, he even says, Quint says, put your businesses on a paying basis. Y'all know me, know what I do for a living. I'll catch this bird for you, but it's not going to be easy. Bad fish. Come on. We all know. Everybody knows. Uh, it may seem odd now that Spielberg's film ditched so much of Benchley's story. Contemporary films based on bestsellers generally strive to be as faithful to the books as possible, lest they provoke the wrath of the author's hardcore fans. But that kind of slavish fidelity to a film's literary source is a fairly recent phenomenon. For instance, Three Days of the Condor, which was the seventh highest grossing film of 1975, Jaws was number one, was based on a James Grady novel called Six Days of the Condor. The filmmaker, Sidney Pollack, discarded much of the book's material in order to make his film tighter. By the way, another great movie. That's one of the reasons uh, Robert Redford was hired to be in Captain America the Winter Soldier, because he was in those, he was in uh, All the President's Men, Three Days of the Condor, you know. If they think of him at all, <clears throat> if they think of him at all anymore, pop fiction fans probably remember Peter Benchley as a one book wonder. That isn't entirely fair. It might be more accurate to think of him as a one-decade wonder. He cranked out two more bestsellers before the end of the 1970s. The Deep was the fourth best-selling novel in America for the year of 1976, and it was adapted into a successful 1977 film by director Peter Yates, who directed Krull. I don't know why I said that, but he did. The Island was the 14th best-selling novel of 1979 and was adapted by Michael Ritchie into a 1980 cinematic flop. By the way, The Island, not to be mistaken for Michael Bay's The Island, fucking rules. I love that movie. (laughs) After that, where's... Why don't people talk about The Island? It's a lot of fun. Uh, After that, Benchley was never much of a pop cultural force at all. 
He published five more novels between 1982 and 1994, but none became a huge seller. Like John Denver, The Bee Gees, and Olivia Newton-John, he was never again as big as he'd been in the 1970s. But as pop fiction experts John Sutherland and Grady Hendrix have pointed out, Benchley's Jaws inspired a lot of imitators. He may not have produced a lot of thrillers himself, but he blazed a trail for plenty of others. In his seminal 2017 work, Paperbacks from Hell, The Twisted History of the 70s and 80s Horror Fiction, Grady Hendrix amusingly illustrates how Jaws midwifed books about killer dogs, killer cats, killer rabbits, killer ants, killer slugs, killer maggots, killer scorpions, killer moths, killer worms, and just about every other kind of non-human creature on Earth. By the way, James Herbert's The Rats, Lair and Domain. If you want to read books about killer rats, there's your trilogy. Um, By the way, Grady Hendrix, can I just stop for a minute and say, Grady Hendrix, I both love your book, Paperbacks from Hell, and I love the fact you've taken it upon yourself to put a lot of the books you mentioned in this book back into print. But can I just can I just say here that your book fucking ruined going to the Iliad bookstore. I used to go to the Iliad bookstore and I could buy for the entire time I lived in LA since it opened. You could go to the Iliad bookstore and you could get any lurid horror paperback from the 70s or late 60s, 70s and 80s early 80s that you wanted. They were there. People brought them in. They were there. You could get whatever you wanted. And then you put out this fucking book, Paperbacks from Hell, and every single, taken off the shelves. Now all you can get is Stephen King, Dean Koontz, and whomever else. But all those great lurid paperbacks. I mean, to be fair, I have a lot of them right here. But you ruined that for everybody, Grady. But God bless, because you're putting them out again. But it's not the same. Not every offspring of Jaws was pure dreck. Hendrix cites Stephen King's 1981 killer canine tale, Cujo, as one of the more respectable entries in the genre. Sutherland identifies John Godley's 1978 thriller, The Snake, as not only a true offspring of Jaws, but also one of the best. This is from his his work. One work which does perhaps deserve some attention is John Godley's The Snake. In this novel, the Jaws-like plot device, an 11-foot mamba loose and killing Central Park, is made secondary to the grisly comedy about New York's free-floating, always-on-the-boil hysteria. In consequence, the snake seems to be as much a satire on Jaws mania as an imitation of the other novel. Godley's novel focuses on the same trio of hunters as Jaws. An echo okay herpetologist who wants to save the reptile, a hard-nosed cop with a midlife crisis, and a vicious Jesus freak sect who want to destroy the snake as the incarnation of evil. The snake includes passages that could have been lifted straight out of Jaws in which the mayor of New York and the police chief argue about closing Central Park in the middle of a long, hot summer. Godley, real name Morton Friedgood, was a successful novelist whose 1973 thriller the taking of Pelham 123 was made into a successful 1974 film, also co starring Robert Shaw and Walter Matthau. And Kino Lorber released that on 4K a couple months back. If you guys haven't seen the original taking of Pelham 123, it's a banger. And peak New York verisimilitude. Um, and it kind of, in a way, it kind of reminds you of Die Hard with a Vengeance. Sort of. But it's a great movie. He'd been publishing novels since the 1940s, and he was a more prolific and more talented novelist than Benchley. Nevertheless, Jaws had become so influential by the late 1970s that even he felt compelled to crib from it. Book critics in 1974 described Jaws variously as a thriller, a tale of suspense, an action story, and the best man versus fish story since 1871. Moby Dick was frequently evoked in reviews. John Sutherland noted that essentially Jaws belongs not to the literary tradition, but to a best-selling entertainment fashion or gimmick of the early 1970s, the disaster story. He was referring to novels such as Arthur Haley's Airport and Paul Gallico's The Poseidon Adventure, as well as the hit films they spawned, but many, if not most, book critics of the era categorized Jaws as a horror novel. 
The reviewer for the Philadelphia Inquirer called the book a horror story and noted that Jaws proves once again that you don't need demons or exorcists to create blanching, relentless terror. Today's horror novels and films tend to include some aspect of the supernatural. Without a supernatural element, they are usually just identified as gritty procedurals or supercharged thrillers. Back in the 1970s, however, pop culture genres tended to be more loosely defined. Thus, Jaws, which possess a monster but no supernatural component, was regarded by many as the best horror novel of 1974. Curiously, on April 5, 1974, two months after its publication, Doubleday published another unknown author's debut horror novel, this one with a strong supernatural twist. Doubleday had high hopes for this novel and put out an initial print run of 30,000 hardcover copies. Alas, only about half of those sold, and the rest were remaindered or pulped. But two years later, when Brian De Palma's film version of the novel was released, Stephen King's Carrie became a massive paperback bestseller. If you had asked a publishing industry insider on New York's Eve 1970 or New Year's Eve 1974 to predict which of that year's debut novelists would go on to become the most successful American horror novelist of all time, that insider would almost certainly have named Peter Benchley. 50 years on, we now know that it was King who is destined to dominate American bestseller lists well into the 21st century. Benchley and his books, sadly, would be largely forgotten before the 20th century was up. I know that was a long article, but when I was reading it, I was so entertained by that article uh, that I thought I would share it with you guys. I didn't even finish the article when I started reading it. I figured I'll read the end tonight. So if you're still here with me, there's the story a great story of Peter Benchley's novel, Jaws, which tomorrow celebrates its 50th anniversary of its publication. Now, I would ask all of you, do you have memories of the novel of Jaws? Did you read the book? And obviously the film, I mean, I figured I'd share with you. So I was eight years old uh, in 1975 when I saw Jaws. I know it, it had been playing for a long time. And uh, my best friend at the time, Jeff Swafford, we'd grown up together. We actually, our, our backyards were kind of kitty corner and it was separated by a fence and our dads uh, made a gate in the fence that went to our both of our backyards so we could just go over and see each other whenever we wanted. And I want to say it was it was for his, maybe his birthday, but it couldn't have been because his birthday, maybe it was that long. I mean, his birthday was in February. I can't imagine that we waited that long to see it, but maybe because it played for a long time. And we finally got to go see it, and I saw it in Seattle, downtown Seattle's Coliseum Theater, which was this big, grand theater that was on a corner. It had this great wraparound marquee, and it was right in the middle of Seattle's movie theater district. The town theater was across the street, and the um, the music box theater was up there too, and they were 70 millimeter theaters, and... and uh, the Coliseum played a lot of like, it was almost like universal, like a, a universal exclusive. Cause I saw things like I saw a roller coaster in sense around in that theater, but jaws was that theater. I remember I, I saw flash Gordon there. Actually, I saw David Cronenberg film festival when scanners open. They showed, they came from within the brood rabbit. And then they showed uh scanners, which was dope. They didn't show fast company, maybe because it wasn't horror, but the Coliseum was awesome. It was one of these awesome theaters, but it it was it was very much it turned into kind of a grungy soda stick grindhouse meaning uh, when i say soda stick soda had spilled on the floor so when you walk down the floor uh, your feet stuck to the ground that was what soda stick was that's what we called it um but it was a great theater and i remember i remember going to see jaws finally and it was like a big deal and maybe it was february cuz it played for you know i couldn't go see it for my birthday i don't i don't know if it had opened yet cuz my birthday was in May and Jeff's was in February and he was, he was, he, he, his birthday was before mine. So he, I think maybe it was for his ninth birthday or maybe not. I don't remember. Um, all I know is that that's when I saw it. Jaws, you know, and it was it, for kids. Like when you're eight years old, parents at that time were not keen to take kids to see Jaws. It's too, it's too extreme. You know, you're going to be 
scared or whatever. But it it was like, you know, for me, as I was already a movie fan, and this was 75, I mean, 75, this was like probably the biggest blockbuster. It was like, for me, it was my first big movie. Like, I'd seen all the Disney films. Like, I'd seen uh, the Herbie movies. I'd seen Island at the Top of the World. And I, I'd see a ton of movies. My parents took me to see a ton of movies. But I... um I want to say Jaws might have been my first PG movie, but it might have been The Land That Time Forgot. I'd have to go back and look at the dates, but I think Jaws was the first PG movie I ever saw. Exorcist II, The Heretic, was the first R-rated movie I ever saw, and what a disappointment that was. But Jaws was a big deal, so it was a big milestone moment in my life seeing that in the theater, and uh, I was impressionable. (laughs) I mean, I'd never seen anything like that before. Of course, it opens with a girl stripping down naked. This was a this was a year before Logan's Run, with Jenny Agutter in the ice cave. Hubba hubba, the love the love shop. I mean, man, I knew I wanted that, but uh, it was a big deal. I mean, for an eight year old at the time, now it probably seems silly to say that, but it was amazing. It was amazing to 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 be in that theater and to see Jaws. It was dope. And I uh, loved every minute of it. And I think I made my parents take me back like twice. And they it was also the first, I'd seen it, but one time I was dropped off. You know, I'm an eight-year-old kid. I go into a movie theater by myself to watch Jaws. It was the greatest thing ever. Because again, my dad worked in downtown Seattle, very close to the Coliseum Theater. So he would take me on Saturday, drop me off in the theater and come back and pick me up. And... Um, it was amazing. And you know, I'll tell you something else. You know what's really interesting? Here's another story I just remembered. So the first time that I was going to see Star Wars at the UA-150 was the Saturday that Star Wars opened in 1977. And I'd never seen huge lines around the theater because Jaws had been playing for a while. Star Wars was the first time I saw these giant lines around the theater. And my dad took me and my friend Gardner Morelli to go see Star Wars But when we weren't going to get in, I was really crestfallen. I was really pissed. But my dad took us to the Coliseum Theater where I'd seen Jaws. This is now two years later. And we saw a double feature of, again, Universal. Maybe the, the, the car was Universal. We saw the car and race with the devil. <laughs> that was a double feature, man. I mean, the car, but race with the devil still. Maybe Race with the Devil instilled in me with my love of satanic. I love movies about satanic cults. Bring them on. Race with the Devil might have been the first satanic cult movie I saw in the theater. It was awesome. That's an aside. It has nothing to do with Jaws. Just it's the same theater I saw Jaws in. That's why I'm thinking about it. I don't know what you guys think, but uh, let me jump in and see if you had left any uh, super chats or tips or anything like that. Uh, the first super chat comes from Connor Thor. Ooh, Connor Thor. Not about Jaws, but I think you left this maybe before I started the show. I just saw 2001 A Space Odyssey for the first time. Wow, what a movie. I still can't wrap my head or uh, around the ending. Do you have a theory or has it been explained by Kubrick? Well, you're in luck because I saw this question before I started reading the article. And... Um, there, there is there is a great, one of my favorite film books about the making of any movie is The Making of Kubrick's 2001. And there's a lot of, in that book, it has section a section where people wrote letters to Stanley Kubrick asking him to explain the ending of the movie. He didn't like to do that. He didn't like to do that because he, he, was, he would always ask, well, what do you think it means? You know, and, um, but... But uh, there is a Screen Rant article, uh, and this was published on October 19th by Ben Sherlock of 2023. So it's a recent article. And um, this is this is pretty interesting. And uh, uh, I, I thought this was interesting when I first read it. But Stanley Kubrick, this is in the article, Stanley Kubrick tended to avoid explaining his movies, instead leaving it up to the audience to determine their own meaning. Yet he made an exception in the case of 2001. Actually, not if you read the making of 2001, he didn't. Yet he made an exception in the case of 2001, which is frequently ranked among Stanley Kubrick's best movies. In an interview that resurfaced from an unreleased 1980 documentary by a filmmaker, uh, Junichai Yao, 
Kubrick explained via IndieWire, I've tried to avoid doing this ever since the picture came out. When you just say the ideas, they sound foolish. Whereas if they're dramatized, one feels it, but I'll try. The idea was supposed to be that Dave Bowman is taken in by godlike entities, creatures of pure energy and intelligence with no shape or form. They put him in what I suppose you could describe as a human zoo to study him, and his whole life passes from that point on in that room. And he has no sense of time. It just seems to happen as it does in the film. They chose this room, which is a very inaccurate replica of French architecture. It was deliberately so inaccurate because one was suggesting they had some idea of something that he might think was pretty, but wasn't quite sure. Just as we're not quite sure what what do in zoos with animals to try, what we aren't quite sure what do in zoos with animals to try and give them what we think is their natural environment. Anyway, when they get finished with him, as happens in so many myths of all cultures in the world, he is transformed into some kind of super being and sent back to Earth, transformed and made into some sort of a superman. We have to only guess what happens when he goes back. Is it the pattern of a great deal of mythology? And that is what we were... Tra- oh, he said... No, it's not. that's not a question. He says, it is the pattern of a great deal of mythology, and that is what we were trying to suggest. Now, for me, what I that's kind of what I always thought about it, but... I, 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 I kind of always thought that if you, if you think about it, the monolith was left, I mean, by whether it's God, whether it's these super beings he talks about, some kind of force, some kind of, of and by the way, there are uh, four 2001 novels all written by Arthur C. Clarke. And the first one is not a novelization of 2001. It's a book that was written concurrently to the movie being produced. So many of the, the themes are dealt with, but there's a lot more explained. Like the apes have names, like Moonwatcher. When, if you ever read the novel, you'll never stop watching the movie and think about you're looking at Moonwatcher. You, you have a, your name in your head of that the, the, the ape. But there's 2001, 2010, which was also made into a movie, but I wish they would remake. You could remake 2010 now and and and, and do the book. Uh the book was, it was changed and simplified, but so this 2001, 2010, 2061, and 3001, The Final Odyssey, where you deal with Frank Poole, <laughs> the, the astronaut that was killed by Hal. But so the monoliths, you know, are are like signposts. And there, when we reach, a, if we reach a certain stage of evolution and we uncover the monoliths, Uh, the first monolith, you know, points to the moon and when human beings are now settling on the moon and they discover, I think it's Tycho, Tycho crater, um, they find another buried monolith and that monolith points to Jupiter and beyond the infinite. And then there's a much bigger monolith in Jupiter space. So the aliens knew that when we reach a certain level of maturity, maturity, um, we will travel through the Stargate and and meet them. And the, our reward, in my mind, our reward, Dave Bowman is the first of us, is the next stage in our evolution. And, and maybe he's come to Earth as the Messiah or whatever. I always thought it was kind of a bummer that in 2010, you do see David Bowman, but he's... It, it, there, there isn't any kind of like messianic transformation of Earth, which, but, you know, so there you go. That's what you get. And um, I I appreciate that, Connor. Thank you for the question. Uh, Garrick Groover says, speaking of 2001, which movie should be seen on the biggest screen possible? My vote goes to Lawrence of Arabia. Hey, look, Garrick, that's a great idea. Lawrence of Arabia, the uh, uh, Once Upon a Time in the West, um, the Man with the Mouth No Name trilogy, especially Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. You know, a lot of the big Technicolor epics. West Side Story is great. Anything that was... In 70 millimeters should be seen on the big screen. 2001, of course. Patton looks incredible on the big screen. You know, even things like Krakatoa East of Java. Um, those movies, the 50s and 60s, when they went into wide gauge filmmaking, if you could see those on the big screen, uh, they were great. You know, um, 
trip. Hey, the Road Warrior. See the Road Warrior on the on the big screen. But anything that was shot, you know, Die Hard. But uh, Lawrence of Arabia, yes. I mean, with those huge compositions. I just recently watched Ben Hur. Ben Hur, I saw in seventy millimeter on the big screen. Uh, those things always a good thing. Madam Webb. Uh, Madam Webb says, Madam Webb sends in a tip and says, Rob, when you come over this Valentine's Day to see me, make sure you bring your Dune one size fits most popcorn bucket so you can have something to do and eat while you watch me squirt in the faces of toxic men with my web. Pour in some extra butter. (laughs) Well, Madam Webb, uh, if I don't remember that you're there, I look forward to to that. I hope you just don't look like Shelob though. Uh, Garrett Groover says, what do you think of Ronald D. Moore? Considering Moore started writing for TNG, DS9, and Voyager, uh, would you like to see him return to Star Trek? You know, I no, I, I wouldn't. I, I don't want to see anybody who used to write on Star Trek return. I would much rather see Ron Moore did Outlander. You know, he started that. Obviously, he and David Icke co-created the New Galactica, and he's a co-creator for all mankind, which I think is way better than any of the modern Star Trek shows are. So, I mean, I I see Picard Season 3 as an exception to all of that, but I would say Ron Moore, I'm a big fan of his. I mean, I've met him. I've interviewed him. I'd like to interview him about For All Mankind. I think he's a great guy, and um, yeah. So... Uh, I thought it was great. I thought he was great, and I don't think that he should come back to Star Trek. I think I think Star Trek should be a product of the writers from the time uh, it's created. I just think that all of what they're doing now is is wrong headed. But that's just me. Uh, Scott Bartholomew says Jacqueline Bissett was born to play in the deep. Ha ha. Yeah, I mean. I saw the deep in the theater. Everybody had to see the deep in the theater. You know, and it was kind of, it had a poster that had Jacqueline Bissett underwater and it was kind of redolent, you know, of Jaws. I mean, there was no shark, but, and the deep just, while I liked it, it certainly, it's more of a thriller than Jaws. It's different. Um, uh, Tom Jr. Jackson says, since next year is the 50th anniversary of Dog Day Afternoon, give me your memories of it. A uh, great show tonight as well. Jaws is a class. You know, Dog Day Afternoon is not, I don't have like a lot of memories of it. I think the first time I saw Dog Day Afternoon was actually on TV. But I remember not understanding what, what did John, what did, what, what were they trying to get for John Cazal? <laughs> now it has a lot more resonance. But at the time, um, I, I didn't, I didn't quite know what it was all of what what it was all about but uh, I really love Dog Day Afternoon I think it's a a great film and what a great performance from uh Pacino the whole movie is great uh Brandon Martin says Jaws was the first film that made me aware of filmmaking as a kid I watched must have watched the making of Doc on the second VHS tape as much as the movie oh yeah I mean the making of Jaws and by the way a nightmare you know, Spielberg famously thought he was going to get fired every day, like Coppola on The Godfather, a nightmare. But David Brown, the great David Brown, told him just to keep shooting. Uh, the documentary, especially the documentary that's on the Blu-ray and the 4K, uh, that documentary is great. And the deleted scenes, I ain't going, Mr. Quint. I ain't getting on that mean old bodge or, or, or getting on that old bodge going after that mean old shock. That guy, <laughs> yeah, no wonder he didn't make the final cut. Um, I love it. The documentary is great. Um, <laughs> 1001 Johnny has a great quote. Actually, uh, this is, uh, this is great. I, <clears throat> I don't know if I can do it in the right voice. Beware the beast man, for he is the devil's pawn. Alone among God's primates, he kills for sport or lust or greed. Yea, he will murder his brother to possess his brother's land. Let him not breed in great numbers, for he will make a desert of his home and yours. Shun him, shun him, drive him back into his jungle lair, for he is the harbinger of death. That's the 29th scroll, verse 6. 
And for those of you who are wondering, what the fuck was that? Ba-bam! Go ape! 20th Century Fox, now 20th Century Studios, wants you to go ape. But you know what? We can't, because we're not going to get it in 4K. We got Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes coming out on the 24th of May. Can you get the Planet of the Apes movies, the originals? Planet, Beneath, Escape, Conquest, Battle. Can you get them in 4K? No. Why? Because they're not out in 4K. I've been talking about this for days, 1001 Johnny. Thank you for bringing it up. Don't look for it, Taylor. You might not like what you find. What will he find out there, Doctor? His destiny. Come on, man. Planet of the Apes, one of the great science fiction movies of all time. I mean, kids today, I understand. I get it. I mean, you got the Matrix. But when we were kids, we had Planet of the Apes. Ah, boy. Boy, oh boy. I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing t- can take in- be taken from it. God does it that men should fear before him. That which has already been and what is to be has already been. And God requires an account of what is past. Moreover, I saw under the sun in the place of judgment wickedness that was there and in the place of righteousness Inequity was there, thus saith the teacher. I guess I was trying to read that as Cornelius, which is not really what I should have been doing. Ecclesiastes 3.14 to 3.16. Go ape. (laughs) That's right. Um, Garrett Groover says, Joseph Kaczynski confirmed that Tron Legacy is getting a 4K remaster. Hopefully it's not just a Disney Plus exclusive and we get a disc. Well, I would hope so. I mean, that's a pretty good disc. The Blu-rays are great. I hope they remaster Tron and put my documentary on there. I really do. Now, I have a lot of letters. I've got a lot of letters I would like to get to. For those of you who don't know, you can send me letters uh, right down below to postgeeksingularity.com, and I will read them. And um, here's a couple. And this first one uh, comes from... Tyson uh, Raymeyer. Tyson Raymeyer writes in, hope I got the name right, uh, Salutations Mr. Burnett, referring to Rob Observations 928 and the discussion of fan service versus servicing the fans. One of my favorite fan moments occurred in Rogue One when Red Leader and Gold Leader briefly appeared at the Battle of Scarf. Since Scarf happened before the Death Star battle, they still would have been squadron leaders. Locating those vintage outtakes from 1976 and 77 and incorporating them into Rogue One demonstrated an attention to detail and Star Wars chronology that I really appreciated. It wasn't obtrusive. It wasn't a big deal. It was blink and you'll miss it moment. And it was great. Thank you for keeping up your enthusiasm and positivity. Best regards, Tyson uh it is. It's Ray Meyer. I got it right. Ray Meyer. Well, Tyson, that is a perfect example of what I would consider to be not only fan service, but servicing the fans. I thought that was great, really creative, and it was so great to see that footage again. It was so rad that they found it. And that's the kind of stuff I like because that means the, the, the filmmakers are paying attention and they're giving you what you want, which is fantastic. It's all, it's all anybody can ask. Um... This one comes from Keith O'Neill. Hey, Rob. Uh, Oh, it says Keith O'Neill update. Hey, Rob, on Rob Observations 928, you read my letter. Thank you, by the way, about how I fell out of love with comics. And you suggested I expand my horizons and seek other interests. After you read that, I kind of realized over the past few years, I have. I'd say my interest in comics really began to dwindle in the early days of the pandemic. It was there... I fell back in love with pro wrestling, specifically WWE. I loved WWE during the Attitude Era from 1997 to 2001, for those who aren't fans, and kind of lost interest in the late 00s or the late aughts. But in late February 2020, on a whim, I went to WWE SmackDown with a friend, and I was a fan again. I heard the women's division was on par with the men's then, but I had no idea how genuinely great they are. It is stacked with talent, like 
Io Sky, the current WWE Women's Champion. Rhea Ripley, who has been on a tear during her Women's World Heavyweight Championship reign. Becky Lynch, Piper Niven, Chelsea Green as a fun tag team. Asuka, pronounced Asuka. Or Asuka? As- oh, Asuka. Okay, Asuka. Bianca Blair. And the 2024 Women's Royal Rumble winner, Bailey. The men's division is impressive too. Roman Reigns is now approaching three and a half years straight as the WWE Undisputed Universal Champion. Corey Rhodes, the latest back-to-back Royal Rumble winner, is arguably the face of the entire industry and not just the WWE. Seth Rollins is such a charismatic world heavyweight champ. LA Knight is great with the mic work. And Gunther is such an unstoppable force in his intercontinental championship reign. You also suggested I watch films on the AFI Top 100 list, and that's something else I've been working on since 2020. I've seen 72 out of the 100 movies on the list. Notable films I've yet to watch include Schindler's List, Gone with the Wind, Shane, Intolerance, and Platoon. All of those are bangers. Um, I love Shane. I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but I must say Billy Wilder has to be a top two film director of all time. I agree. He has such a wide-ranging filmography. Watching stuff like Sunset Boulevard and Double Indemnity was a discovery to me, not to mention The Apartment and Some Like It Hot. By the way, uh, Sunset Boulevard is one of my favorite movies, and Double Indemnity is the Star Wars of noir. (laughs) Uh, Not to mention The Apartment and Some Like It Hot. Both of those are great. I love The Apartment. I have a great box set for that on Blu-ray. And I have it on 4K as well but they're from different companies. I also found I really enjoy noir films like The Night Holds Terror, which was based on a true home invasion of in Los Angeles in 1953. It stars John Cassavetes in his first notable film role. That movie also holds the distinction of being one of, if not the very first movie, shot completely on location. No sets used at all. Underworld UFA, USA, starring a young Cliff Robertson, is another entertaining noir film for those interested. So thanks, Rob. I didn't realize it, but I already replaced one interest with several others. And more importantly, stay metal. Yeah. Kevin O'Neill, or Keith O'Neill, pardon me. Uh, Kevin O'Neill is a comic artist. <laughs> Keith, thanks for writing in. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you. I love that. I mean, you know, here's the funny thing. Whenever I don't like something, if I like, you know, my disdain for Star Trek, I have to watch it, but I use it to fuel something else to go find, okay, if I don't like this, it gives me time to like delve into something I always wanted to delve into, but didn't quite get around to doing. That's always a good thing. So love hearing that you have done that. Um, Scott Bartholomew writes in. 90s alternative rock. Rob, you need to sh- do a show on 90s alternative rock. The music and TV show discussions are great, but the music eclipses those genres. Just a thought. Thanks for the consideration. Uh, Scott, R. Scott. Scott, you know what? That's not a bad idea, but it, it's just I don't. Here's the thing. I don't. One of my favorite YouTubers is the professor of rock. I think he's great. And I watched him when he first came onto YouTube. He jumped in. He's a very famous Midwestern music critic. But he knows more. And I was really heavily into music, especially in the 80s. But he knows more about the music than I would ever hope to know. And it's not like I wouldn't do a show on on rock. I mean, we sometimes talk about hip-hop on Midnight Musings because Lael knows a lot about hip-hop, way more than I know. Um I just don't think I could do a great show on 90s alternative rock. Not that I couldn't reminisce about what songs we liked, but I don't know if I could offer any insight into it, at least not as much as the professor of rock. So I will say this. If you are a music fan and you like pop music, I cannot recommend the professor of rock's channel more highly than I do. Um, I love that channel. It's a beautifully produced YouTube channel. The Professor of Rock's a great personality, and he loves music. He loves music. So, hey, while I'd love you to like and subscribe, I would encourage anyone with a cursory interest of music, and whether you know a lot about music or not, whether you were born earlier or later, the Professor of Rock's channel is a rabbit hole I am happy to send you down. 
So it's a really great channel. If you don't know it, um, check it out. Um, because, uh, I think it's great. I think it's a great channel. Uh, here comes Ian Klein writes, just some thanks. Hey Rob, hope you're good. I realized that I only tend to interact with you and I disagree with you about politics, which tends to be a lot, but not so much about postmodern issues. So for a change, I wanted to show some love and thank you for enriching my knowledge of literature and cinema. Although these topics have always been my area of interest, I'm from Brazil and I end up not having access about some things, so I don't know where to look. Keep recommending horror novels. <laughs> Live long and prosper. Well, what a cool letter to get. Uh, Ian, thank you very much. All the way from down under. Uh, all the way from Brazil. One day I got, I've wanted to go to Brazil ever since I saw Moonraker. <laughs> Carnival, you know, didn't you guys just have Carnival? Did I, was I missing something or did I see a gigantic... Star Wars float with Imperial Walkers, this huge, tall Star Wars float spewing all this stuff with a uh, AT-ATs and stormtroopers. It looked badass. I've always wanted to go, plus Brazilian girls. I might be too old for that, but you know, you can look, right? <laughs> but that, thank you. I, I, I do appreciate that. I mean, I'm a big fan of horror novels, but like I, you know, give him a shout out. Grady Hendrix, uh, his seminal book, Paperbacks from Hell. Most people, most horror novel fans already know this book. And Grady Hendrix has been getting a lot of the more, some obscure books, but get Grady Hendrix paperbacks from hell book. If you're interested at all in horror literature, uh, I certainly am. I have a lot of it. So great stuff and get that book and then find out. I don't, there's a certain, there's a certain label. I don't know off the top of my head what it is, but where Grady Hendrix has been republishing a lot of those books. So, um, yeah, check that out. But thanks for writing in and thanks for the kind words. A uh, Canadian Starfleet recruiting uh, writes in and says, How to diversify with class. Uh, greetings, Rob, from the far north. I've never written in before, but you mentioned John Schnepp yesterday and it made me nostalgic. The University of Manitoba is working on oh, this, this name's going to kill me. The University of Manitoba is working on. Uh, I can't even pronounce this. It's Anisha Bois. I didn't even want to say this. Uh, uh, Bowie. Anyway, I would say that's First Peoples. Language version of Star Wars. Episode 4 with subtitles and dubs. And are currently looking for translators and casting voice actors. I think this is an eminently better strategy for adding diversity and virtue signaling than the big studios, Disney, etc. currently using. This adds to, instead of taking away or bastardizing, an established IP. Of course, this kind of endeavor won't make profit, so it is of no interest to a big studio. But could the studios have saved themselves millions of dollars by spending money on things like this instead of swollen budget drivel we've been getting? Just my thoughts, Rob. And thanks for all of the awesome DVDs. I didn't know it at the time, but as a young man, I bought so many discs you worked on and yes, I did watch the special features. Oh, he also puts a link into this project. And I'm going to put this. Now, I had read about this. This is not the first time, um, I don't believe so, that it's been, uh, they they have translated um, things into native languages. So wait, here, here's the link. Um, here's the link in the chat. Uh, to that, I've because I think somebody did that here as well. I think. By the way, Brian Erty sends in a super sticker. Uh, thank you, Brian. And this is the third time you've sent a super sticker in on this live show. So thank you for that. Oh, here's a twenty dollars super chat from the fan with no name. Do you have a whistling theme song, like? <whistles> Do you have one like that? You got to come up with one. The fan with no name says, Hey, Rob, I'm accepting your challenge. Oh, man. Watching Antonioni's The Eclipse trilogy. You know, it's the Ennui trilogy of which The Eclipse is the third movie. So it's La Note, La Ventura, and The Eclipse. Not going to lie, it's a hard watch while I'm sitting here with COVID. Also, I'm hard-pressed 
to find anyone reference uh, ref- reference it as the Eclipse trilogy. You know, it's the Ennui trilogy. The the word Ennui, like it's spelled like Anui. It's Ennui, so it's the Ennui trilogy, not the Eclipse. And I now, first of all, I'm going to give you all the credit in the world for taking a shot because. The thing is, and as I've told, so 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 what the fan with no name is referencing is I've often talked about how modern film fans do not, and this isn't to be a dick, and it's not to be like, aren't I better than you? It's it's nothing like that. I just try and point out that modern audiences are not trained and they they do not have the ability to go back and watch a lot of the European cinema of the 50s and 60s, French New Wave, because it, the the pacing of it, um, it's like the, the guy who created OpenAI who's going, I don't watch movies before 1995 because they're all slow and artificial and boring. Now, I get it. He was nine years old in 1995, so he probably wasn't watching movies until, they, until 1995. I get it. But... The Antonioni's Ennui trilogy is a difficult sit. And while I grew up, I love these films, they're, they do not, and the reason they're a difficult sit is because they do not work like a normal three-act structured movie. Like like La Ventura, The Adventure, basically this, these bourgeois people, take they're like taking an afternoon they take a boat to a little island and there's a girl with them and the girl disappears and what does it all mean it's 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 a completely different mode of it's not telling a traditional story so american audiences now especially audiences who've only watched movies since 19 say 80 upwards would find it incredibly frustrating and i don't when i challenge people to do it it's not it's not to prove my point. What I want to do is I want to show people when people when when people are like I can't believe Martin Squiss says he's talking about how terrible superhero movies are and how it's not cinema. And my answer to that is it's I know he said that. And he's using hyperbole. I don't think he really means that it's actually not cinema. What he is saying is that the cinema the cinema, the art of film, like right now American movies are a collision of art and commerce. And commerce is winning. Commerce, you know, it used to be, and because movies are being made for the global audience, the studios are not making very intellectually challenging movies. I mean, the fact that Universal made Oppenheimer is amazing. And the fact that the, the only reason they would have made it is because of of uh, Christopher Nolan. But the fact that Yorgos Lanthimos was able to make poor things, amazing, you know. But even these movies have much more of a traditional structure, whereas if you look into, and you know, um, uh, Alfonso, Alfonso Cuarón's Roma is more along the lines of movies we would have seen in the early '60s. But the Ennui trilogy is tough because not only is it movies that are set in Europe, you know, uh, the 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 way it, the, it's telling a story in a completely different way. It's almost like an alien language. And even though it's subtitled, you you'll understand what the people say, but the story that you're watching, you're going to say, "What is this?" One of the movies that I I recommend that's a, a little bit more of an easy watch, but yet it's confounding, is a movie called Last Year at Marion Bad. And again, I was I was able they played that at the ArcLight. I went and saw it like I don't know eight or nine years ago. I'd never seen it on the big screen before, and I, I took a, this girl that I I was dating at the time. She loved it. She never, she was. She's she's a curator for Christie's in New York, their photography. So she loved the photography there, Jocelyn. And um but it's just a different thing. And you know, I hope when people see those kinds of things, it'll it'll jar them into delving into different kinds of cinema. So fan with no name, first of all, thank you for supporting the channel, but even thank you even more for trying to to brave the Ennui trilogy. I'd love it. I don't know if you've got the time, maybe you could dictate it or something. What you um what you thought, you know, what was your um what you know what you what you thought about it. Garrett Groover says, and Disney, how about you remaster the OG Planet of the Apes movies in 4K, considering you have new Planet of the Apes movies that are coming out this year. Yeah, one would hope. One would hope. Um because that would be obviously a good thing. 
Um, so, um, in terms of this letter, I mean, I'd heard, I think it's really cool that they, they dub movies into different languages. I know it's kind of a stunt and especially indigenous languages. The problem is ultimately, um, if it's subtitled, people can see it. It's always interesting to hear indigenous language spoken. That's why, you know, I think one of the great, um, one of the reasons I love the, so we got the new Shogun miniseries. For those of you who don't know. Shogun, the miniseries, is one of my favorite things I've ever seen on TV. Dun, 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 dun. I love it. Um, I love it so much. But one of the cool things, that the reason I loved it, basically Shogun's, in a way, I thought of it as like a Star Trek episode. People are like, what? But it, it's about you know Captain Blackthorn. <laughs> Imagine Captain Kirk going into a totally alien world that he knew nothing about, and he has to navigate. And the great thing about the, first of all, the Shogun miniseries is great. The book is great. James Clavell's novel is great. But I love the first miniseries. And they don't, they don't subtitle a lot of it in Japanese. It's in, a lot of it's in Japanese, but they don't subtitle it. And you kind of pick up on Japanese by design as you're watching it, the same way that Blackthorn does. You know? And uh, Yoko Shimada, remember, September 15th is Talk Like Yoko Shimada Day. R.I.P. Yoko Shimada. But uh, looking forward to seeing uh, the new Shogun. I hope it's great. Can't wait. Maybe some kid's going to watch it. And um, um, they'll think it's their favorite miniseries that they've ever seen. Brian Erty also sent in another, another super sticker and says, Hey, Rob, I enjoyed Saturday's member call very much. Uh, did you get a chance to watch any more of Belling the Slayer? Brian, I did. Okay, so this is the craziest. This is sometimes people tell you about crazy things that you were unaware of. So this is this is crazy. So many of you might know the movie Capricorn One, directed by Peter Hyams. It stars O.J. Simpson, James Brolin, Sam Watterson, and Hal Holbrook, and Brenda Vaccaro, and Elliot Gould. Um, and it is about a faked Mars mission. You know, it was playing on the whole conspiracy theory that we never went to the moon, but this was about Mars. And Jerry Goldsmith uh, wrote the score for it. And it's one of the great banger scores. It's not like Star Wars, but it's a great, great, great film score. It has one of the greatest main themes ever. Just, you know, Google Capricorn One theme. Listen to it. It's so good. It's one of Goldsmith's best themes. Well, I did not know this, but thanks to Brian Erty and our membership call, apparently... Uh, there was a ballet that was performed and the ballet is called Belling the Slayer and it was performed to the score of Capricorn One. It's actually good. I didn't watch the whole thing all the way through, but if you if you look up Belling, B-E-L-L-I-N-G, Belling the Slayer on YouTube, you can find this tape of the ballet that was done to Goldsmith's score for Capricorn One. Things that make you go, hmm... So I did watch more of it. Uh, I didn't watch it all the way through. Um, but yeah, <laughs> it's, I mean, God bless the modern age. Uh, Scott Bartholomew says, did you see Shatner's response to the EU's plan to censor gendered language? <sighs> yes, I did. So for those of you who don't know, uh, everybody wants to get rid of... I wonder what the so so in our quest to be more inclusive, um, there are people that are trying to get rid of gendered language. I don't know how that's going to work if you're like, oh, I don't know, a Spanish speaker, or if you live in the Holy Land and you speak Hebrew. I mean, a lot of language is gendered. There's the female version and the male version. Um. Dan bat el habait, ima ba'a el habait, you know, if you want Hebrew. And uh, I, I, that's some crazy, that's crazy shit. It is so weird to me, this whole bizarre getting rid of gender is so, uh, I don't get it. I mean, I, I do understand what's going on with all the identity politics, but even the people, it's such a small percentage of the population anyway. And so what happened was, one of the things that they said was, uh, they wanted to get rid of were phrases like where no man has gone before from the opening of Star Trek and William Shatner pushed back because that's too gendered. First of all, um, 
the word human, human, you know, there's woman, man, human, or human. Uh, so where no man is a phrase, which means human, it's not necessarily gendered. Um, and uh, all this stuff is just madness to me because at the end of the day, it takes a man and a woman to fuck, to make a kid. So you can talk about your identity all you want. I'm, I'm happy to acknowledge who, whoever you want to be. You've got to be, go be who, go be your true self. Go be the way you want to be. I will, I'm happy to recognize you however you want to be recognized and however you want me to call you, no problem. But the thing is, there is, ha there has to be a baseline. Language is very important. The meaning of words is important because we need to be able to communicate with one another. That's what language is for. And if the meaning of words suddenly becomes malleable, um, and words are always changing. Language is always changing, so I have no problem with any of that. But it's weird when you take words, like if you want to come up with a new word, come up with a new word. But it's really strange when you take, like, there are rules to language. I was a, I was a kid that always had Strunk and White's The Elements of Style, which is a book about how to write. And it tells you how to use things and, like, how to use a pronoun. And it's bizarre that people want to take pronouns and change them and, like, use the plural to describe themselves because to me that's just bad language it's you're not you put that in a sentence it's like ooh i can't write that in a sentence because it's wrong so i don't like being asked to use language in a wrong way it's kind of like it's a mal it's not really a malapropism after mrs malaprop but i i i hate this idea i'll call you by pronouns if you want to be called that but i'm not going to like it and I'm never going to like it because give me another name. Give me another thing. Don't your preferred pronouns. Why, why, why do you get preferred pronouns? I've always thought that was a weird thing, but that's what Shatner was pushing back on their gendered language, which to me, it's the fact that they bring that up. Here's another thing. Well, in 1987, when the next generation came along, they changed it. They changed it. They changed where no man was changed to where no one. And when somebody comes out and pushes back and Shatner pushed back, he goes, you're going to, you know, you're going to come up, you're going you're gonna to attack a very progressive show that was made in 1966. And you're going to say, we have to change this gendered language. What about the past? You know, and what about the fact that uh, Star Trek led was at the forefront? I mean, yes. Was that progressive? Of course. They did that themselves. But the people that push back against gendered language, oh, and your performance activism, do you forget that Star Trek itself changed it? Where no one has gone before. 1987, folks, September of 1987. They changed it. But yeah, so I did see Shatner's response. This idea of gendered language is so weird. Men and women are different. We're always going to be different. You know, you can say what you want, but we have to eventually procreate. I mean, maybe people won't want to procreate anymore. They're little, human beings will be made in petri dishes. But I mean, at some point, you've got to. If, if you can, you can acknowledge that we're progressing as people and things are changing. I love all that. Great, you know, uh, androgyny. Decide what you are. I, I get all that. But I'm tired of being told what people are not. They're telling me. They're either telling me what they're not. Or they're telling me there's something they're not. I'm either being told they are something, which I don't believe they are, or I'm being told somebody is not something. Tell me what you are. That's all I want to know. Just I, tell me what you want to be called. Tell me who you are. I'll, I, I will take, your, uh, take you up on that. Absolutely, 100%. Be who you want to be. Be your best self. I will be there for you. I will acknowledge you however you want to be acknowledged. But why is it that everyone, everybody wants to change things you know, I still need to be able to write. <laughs> Strunk and white, elements of style, the English language, how to write. Why do we have to change language and make it wrong? Come up with a new word. That's more exciting anyway. Um, but yeah, gendered language is, um, yeah. And the thing is, Star Trek already addressed this. It was really annoying. I was, I was annoyed by this whole thing because it's like virtue signaling. Here, here's somebody's trying to make a point. We're going to get rid of gendered language. Well, if you're a Spanish speaker, how are you going to do that? Many languages are gendered. You can't get rid of that. 
Unless you decide, ah, Spanish, we got rid of we, the whole language is gendered, so we're going to get rid of it. It's so weird. It's such a bizarre thing. I mean, I took Spanish, you know, conjugating those verbs. <laughs> That's, oh, uh, tienes, tenemos, tienen. I, I mean, you know, but I don't think people are thinking that one through. Uh, Jason Webster says Godzilla minus one is very close to becoming the second highest grossing international film of all time at the U S box office. Um, yeah. Isn't that cool? I think it's so cool. And it proves that look, any franchise can be rehabilitated for the modern age. And, um, you know, you just need talented people that know what they're doing. Um, and I think that's very cool. The fan with no name comes back and says, I will say I fucking loved blow up great double feature with the conversation. And while I'm at it, thank you for the secret history recommendation. Well, fan with no name, you and I clearly park our shuttlecrafts in the same shuttle bay. Now the Antonioni on we trilogy is one thing, but Antonioni's blow up, which takes place in swing in London. Yeah, baby. Uh, is another thing entirely. That's a much more accessible movie with David Hemmings. And uh, um, Blow Up also makes a great feature with Brian De Palma's Blow Out, but it also makes a great feature with The Conversation, Francis Ford Coppola's The Conversation, released in 1974, the same year as Godfather 2. What a year for Francis C. Or F F FFC. Um, I'm glad you watched that, and The Secret History is so good. How great would that movie be? I mean, it would be so good. Um, at least I think it would be, um, so a hundred percent, let's see, who am I missing here? I want to make sure I'm not missing anybody. Um, let me just make sure I, I've caught up with everyone. So yeah, I think I'm good. Uh, I have another letter. 1001 Johnny sent me a audio thing. That's like 20 minutes long. I would play it on the show. But I think that might be a little weird. But so I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to upload it as its own piece of video. He's a great supporter of the channel. He's uh, uh, he's always on our member chats. And I think that his letter was very interesting. So I'm going to put it up. I gotta, I'm got i going to put a little zhuzh, zhuzh on it and um, put some graphics up. But I'm going to put 1001 Johnny's piece up as a audio commentary. Uh, this letter comes from Omar 94 and Omar 94 says it's time for an older Spider-Man. Oh, you know what? He wants this on midnight musings. I'm going to save that for midnight musings. So I will. Speaking of Godzilla minus one, Dan Bagdoyan, Dan Bagdoyan writes in a letter, Godzilla minus one. Hey Rob, I am a lifelong Godzilla fan. I grew up not only on Godzilla, but Ultraman, Johnny Sacco, Gamera, among others. Japanese monsters have always been a part of my life. Would just like to get your thoughts on Godzilla and the Japanese kaiju genre, genre in general. Also, do you think the eventual Blu-ray release of Godzilla Minus One will include the Minus Color version? I love your show and what you do. You are easily my favorite YouTuber. Oh, that's so nice of you. Uh, to quote the Romulan commander from Balance of Terror... You and I are one of a kind in a different reality. I could have called you friend. Damn, I love Mark Leonard. So do I. That wasn't a very good Mark Leonard impression. But uh, peace and long life existential one. Dan, Dan, Dan. Uh, first of all, I love the kaiju genre. And I will say this. My favorite original Showa era kaiju movie is Rodan. Um, I actually saw, when I was a kid... I remember seeing Rodan before I saw Godzilla. And Rodan's in color. And for those of you who haven't seen Rodan, um, Rodan starts, uh, it's a horror film. There's a miner that they rescue from this mine where people have disappeared and, and this miner's hospitalized and you know he's freaking out and has to be sedated and you you actually see flashbacks of what he saw in the mine and when he was in the mine he saw you know mini rodan um and uh the 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 creatures the giant like meal worms that they ate and it's a straight up horror movie and it, it's hardcore and then of course 
Rodan, you know, grows and is born and eats the eats the creatures and eats the giant mealworms, the tent caterpillars, whatever they are. And when I was a kid, I thought it was the coolest thing ever. And then, of course, the, the Rodan uh, comes to life and they have to fight Rodan and and it has a tragic engi- ending in Mount Fuji. But I love Rodan and I've always loved the kaiju genre. Uh, kaiju genre, the the kaiju genre to me uh, was, I, I mean, it was really interesting because. Again, I saw all these movies on Channel 11. Uh, they played on Sci-Fi Theater uh, on Sundays at 2 o'clock. And they showed most of them. You know, they showed... I mean, somehow in the 70s, we saw Godzilla versus Megalon a thousand times. So everyone knew who Jet Jaguar was and all that. And But but I, you know, I love Destroy All Monsters because who wouldn't? My favorite was Godzilla versus the Astro Monster because, or Godzilla's uh, um, um, Monster Zero. I, I love that because there's Planet X and the alien. The how do you not love aliens that look like hot Japanese girls in black and silver? I mean, come on. And then the controller. But I love the whole genre, and I love like things like the Mysterians too. Just Japanese science fiction in general. Matango, <laughs> you know. I mean, I Gorath, the green slime. Um, I loved all that stuff, and and because it it combined science fiction monsters and and it was it was all it was great stuff. No, we didn't get a lot of the TV stuff like we didn't get the Ultraman stuff. We didn't get the Super Sentai stuff. Like I didn't see Common Rider until later. Um but all the 50s and 60s Japanese science fiction, I loved it. Loved it. So I was a big fan. Big fan. Um so yeah, big fan. And uh, thanks for writing in. I really appreciate that. And thank you for the kind words. I, I uh, appreciate that very, very much. Thank you. Because the alternative, <laughs> I get a lot of the alternative. Um... <laughs> uh, this is a great letter. So for many people who know about this channel, Braxton Bowes is a young man. I, I would imagine he's, is he eight now? Is Braxton eight? Um. He's eight. Okay, so here's here's what Braxton writes. Why I think Star Trek is better than Star Wars. Dear Rob, I have been watching you since I was four. By the way, he went, Braxton did go to a Star Trek convention and, and talked to Shatner on the stage. He was in the audience. Dear Rob, I've been watching you since I was four and I am now eight. As you know, I've been a Star Trek fan my entire life. I started watching as a baby. In fact, the greatest moment of my life was getting to meet William Shatner. And the thing I'm saddest about is never meeting Nichelle Nichols, who was supposed to be at my con, the 55-year mission, but canceled and died soon after. When I say I like Star Trek, I mean anything from Enterprise back, even though I like some stuff from the modern fake Trek stuff, season three of Picard and some lower decks and strange new worlds, but no none Discovery. <laughs> So to be fair, I will only talk about real Star Trek and the first six Star Wars to show why I feel this is. First, I feel Star Trek is more real than Star Wars. Now, I know both are pretend, but Star Trek gives you a feeling about what it would be like to work in space. In space, it would not be just laser battles and stuff. Mostly, it would be exploring. In Star Wars, it is mostly good guys and bad guys. Empire bad, rebels good. Not that way in Star Trek. In Arena, when the Gorn tells Kirk they were invading the planet, Dr. McCoy said we may be in the wrong. Star Trek is brain food, and I like getting my brain fed. Star Wars is fun, but it is not brain food. I like the episode of Deep Space Nine when Sisko sees himself as a writer in the past, Benny, and they won't put his story in a magazine because they have a black captain. I went to school and asked my teacher, did this stuff really happen? And she told me all the time. I feel that's wrong and we need to do better. Star Trek tells me we can do better. I wish all my friends at school watched Star Trek. They tell me I'm dumb because I watch a dumb show. (laughs) Braxton, don't listen to them. They're wrong. I can't understand why people do not like brain food, and that is what Star Trek is. It is true they do some stories that are just fun, like Trouble with Tribbles or Rascals, 
but some talk about important stuff like the measure of a man or let this be your last battlefield. Star Wars does not give me this. When I was at the con, I was excited to meet Maggie Threat, who was... <laughs> when I was at the con, I was excited to meet Maggie Threat, who was one of Mud's women, or Bobby Clark, who was the Gorn. But I don't care if I ever meet Luke or Han. <laughs> Braxton, you and I park our shuttlecraft in the same shuttle bay, although I... I would love to meet Harrison Ford or Mark Campbell. I've never met either one of them. I'm happy my daddy showed me Star Trek even as a baby because it was always part of my life and I have the toys and I have the autographs to prove it. Well know that I am only eight, so what I think doesn't matter too much to the world, but I thought I'd tell you anyway. Live long and prosper, Braxton Bowes. Braxton, you and your dad have been writing into the show since I've been doing this show. You are always welcome here, sir. Uh, you're a great kid, and as I would like to say to you, live long and prosper. Or I would hope you would say to me, I shall do neither. I've killed my captain. No, don't say that. <laughs> but anyway, you know what I'm talking about. That was a little muck time for you, in the, uh, done, done, uh, done in reverse. Uh, William La Rochelle writes in, and uh, William says his, his uh, subject headline is, Speculation on the future. Hi, Robert. I'd been in the habit of sending letters, but it created a trap of self-focus, like a kid watching Romper Room, <laughs> waiting for the host to look through the mirror into the TV and say, I see Billy. <laughs> there have been a couple of topics I wanted to touch upon, like whether those of us who submitted a short story for a prose contest will be folded into the next one. Yes. By the way, that's a good question. So... A couple years back, I decided to have a short story contest. I would come up with things or somebody would suggest things on the fly. I'm like, yes, let's do that. We did a film festival, but I never gave out the awards. But the festival was good, and some people, their films have gone on, and they, 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 they've now made other films, and their careers are taking off, which is fantastic. We are going to have a short story competition. Then we are going to pick the winners, and then we're going to crowdfund, because I what I want to do is publish this as a hardcover, slipcased volume with a dust jacket. The book is called The Imagination Connoisseurs. That's the name of the book. The premise is, it, it, what does that mean? What does it mean to be an imagination connoisseur? So the theme of the book is, you can either write a story that would appeal to imagination connoisseurs, you can write a story that delves into what it means to be an imagination connoisseur, how you became an imagination connoisseur, what certain threats do imagination connoisseurs face that might come after their imagination connoisseurship. I don't want to limit it. It's just going to be called The Imagination Connoisseurs. And what we're going to do is we're going to first run a contest. Now, here's the thing. Um, we put it on hold. Everybody who's already submitted a story. We have them all and they're you don't have to write again. They're they're under consideration and all that. But I'm I'm going to hire a professional editor to read the stories and then also work with the writers that we pick to edit their tales. Now, you cannot use AI. Before there was AI wasn't available. There are ways and I was I I had to find this out um from a I heard a science fiction a journal publisher, they were inundated with all these AI-generated stories, and they're just gobbledygook. You can tell. They're just terrible. And he figured out a way um, to tell if there, if AI wrote stories. And um, I know AI is getting better all the time, but I would encourage people, to, please don't use AI, you know. But we're going to do it, and I'm going to launch that. we got two things coming up, crowdfunding campaigns. One is the audio drama with Max Allen Collins. That is something that we need to raise a lot of money for to finish. You're going to hear the proof of concept I recorded, and I think everyone's you'll like it all, so you're going to hear what you're going to get. But what we're going to do with that is Max Allen Collins, who uh, wrote Road to Perdition, he wrote a 19-volume series about Detective Nathan Heller, who begins his career in the 30s, and we're going to adapt the first two books in the series that introduces the character of Nathan Heller. And the, the conceit of the Nathan Heller books is... He's a fictional detective, but he gets involved in real historical events. 
And the first audio drama deals with this the real life assassination of Chicago Mayor Cermak. And one of the characters in the books, the stories, is Frank Nitty, who of course was we saw Frank Nitty in The Untouchables. And Stanley Tucci played Frank Nitty in Road to Perdition. So uh, you know, we're it, it, and it's all SAG actors and all that. So the amount of money we have to raise is a great it's it's a it's a lot of money. Um, but you'll, when you hear the proof of concept, that's already done. I already directed it. Max wrote the proof of concept. We already had actors perform it. You will hear that in the crowdfunding campaign, which we anticipate launching in mid February. Uh, I took Todd Stashwick to Chicago, for instance, and filmed him for the crowdfunding campaign, showing us around where he used to live. We went to second city, the actual second city and all that. So that's the first thing that we're going to do. We're going to have the short story contest. We're going to launch that, but it is going to be like pricey because I I have to pay this editor because I didn't want, if people are going to write short stories, I wanted to make it worth their while. So it'll probably cost like 50 bucks to join. And I also wanted to weed out people that were just going to toss off an AI story. And I wanted people to do it to be serious. And the only way to get people to be serious is to hit their pocketbooks. But all of that money does not go to me. It is going to go to the editor to read the stories and then to edit them and pick them. Because I realized I can't, I, I don't have enough time to do it myself. And I'm going to read the stories that he feeds to me that he says we got to publish this. So even BL Alley, I don't know how, I, I wish BL Alley is well. Um, I hope BL Alley. Uh, comes back to the fold, but even BL Alley, we have not forgotten about you. But anyway, let me get back to this letter. Uh, even if your book is to be called The Imagination Connoisseurs, is that really a theme that should focus, should be the focus of short stories? It was the most difficult aspect for me to shoehorn into my own submission. Just saying. Well, that means I think it is. Look, the Imagination Connoisseurs, can it, that's just the name of the book. It's a suggested theme. Remember, it can be a short story that appeals to people who are Imagination Connoisseurs. It doesn't mean they have to be about Imagination Connoisseurs. It's just called The Imagination Connoisseurs. And that, be that as it may, it's up to you. But yes, that is, I mean, if I wanted to publish a horror anthology, which, by the way, I would love to because I love horror anthologies and I know some horror writers and I'd get some, some names to anchor the book. Um, but, um, yeah, anyway, an issue that pops up a lot on your show, and I hope this is not censored is the question of how future generations will deal with trans issues and whether like modern Star Trek, they will correct each other about preferred pronouns. My take will be politically problematic, but it also feels true. Once people view the human brain as just one more part of the body, we are more likely to refine our technology in the field of brain surgery. We would most likely not have someone in the wrong body because any dysmorphia itself would become the target. You are right that we won't likely to be able to flip every cell in a person's body between XX or XY chromosomes, and realistically, transporter technology won't likely happen. I kind of respect Seth MacFarlane for having a transition character revert. On another issue, which I will wrap up an essay on, obviously the key problem with modern studios and the woke ideology is millionaires punching down at the fan bases for reactions that were inevitable and expected. The practice of Trojan horsing niche content into a general audience IP demands blowback if it is not well done. Disney Lucasfilm could find a solid two-hour theatrical cut of the Willow series if they kept all of Warwick Davis's scenes and removed Kit's romance or anything woke. I may do that edit myself. Anyway, those are just my half-baked thoughts for the moment. Um, yeah, I mean, look, here, here, I do feel that this, uh, as I've said on this show repeatedly, you should never put your universe before your characters and your story, meaning shared universes, multiverses like the Marvels. Everyone wants their own cinematic universe. A cinematic universe, like a cult movie, uh, has to organically happen. You can't just decide to have a universe. You can't. You have to make one good movie and then grow your universe from that. 
And if Iron Man 1 hadn't worked, Iron Man 1 rightfully concentrated on one story of Tony Stark's come to Jesus moment and, and what he did. If they didn't do that, it wouldn't have worked. And then it were, and at the end of the movie, they bring up the Avengers initiative. Um, you know, and I've said this on the show with, with the idea about like, first of all, there are, there are anomalies throughout nature, you know, and, and whether it's gender dysmorphia dysmorphic or not, what I've said, my own, my own, um, having had LGBTQ friends since I was 13 that I was aware of that I knew they were, they were gay, um, they were gay or lesbian. They were they were uh, gay men or lesbians or trans or there was no queer identities. It was mostly very specific identities. It was always apparent to me that those people were born that way. It was a naturally occurring uh, uh, part of nature. And while obviously it wasn't a majority of people, it was to me it was naturally occurring. And um, I've often said that like with the idea of, of trans individuals, uh, like I, I understand what you're saying about maybe brain chemistry. If we understood the brain more, I, I honestly think that, that it really is that body dysmorphia is real, that you, you can be born with a female brain because female brains and male brains have different, there's different things going on. A lot of it's the same, but a lot of it's different that somebody is absolutely born with a female brain in a male body, just like there's intersex people. Why not? And, and I think people are aware of it. And I think at some point, like in the Star Trek universe, they have the kind of techniques where you, you could probably figure that out right away because they would have the technology be like, oh, yeah, okay. So, and they could probably figure out in it in, in utero and the surgical techniques, they could just fix you. I mean, if they could turn you into a, to look like a Romulan, they could fix your body right away and it wouldn't be an issue. Um, especially, can you imagine what what's, that kind of surgery would be like when you have transporter technology combined with it? Lickety split, you wouldn't have any problem with it at all. Now, I don't know if you could alter DNA down to the, you know, that level, but, you know, eventually we'll figure that out and it won't be an issue. Um, but I do think that it's an issue now and I think that people need to be mindful of that. And, um, you know, it's it's a spectrum of, of humanity and how people are born. I just think that what's, what's um, I think that we were on a good path. I think that we were on a good path. We were evolving as a culture. Gay marriage was the law of the land. People were becoming more and more accepting. You saw it over, the, especially with the the gay community. With the I I was there. I had friends that were dying of AIDS in the eighties, and I saw the horrible prejudice, the fear, um, and I watched that change. You know, in a matter of a couple of decades, same sex marriage is a law of the land. One of my very very best friends in the world that I grew up with has been married to. I've talked about this before, married his husband the first time gay marriage was legal in California, then it was rescinded, and they wondered where they where was their marriage at, and then it was reinstated. And and they've been together for 25 years. You know, and I know a lot of couples that I knew couples back when I was in high school, gay couples that have been together for quite some time. So um I think that that's a, a natural evolution because it's it's that kind of acceptance once it's like anything. Once you hang out with people, most people for the that I've found traveling around the world are pretty great. You know, there's more there's more things that are we are are much we are similar than we are different. And who somebody chooses to love or what they how they choose to identify is is I think um, uh, it's an easy thing to accept once you start interacting with people. What I don't like is people that expect the world to change for them. Now, I don't mean in terms of acceptance, but I mean that to demand things of other people on a personal level, I think is wrong. I think that rights are one thing, but you know, when you're interacting and this is for anybody, I don't care how you identify. I don't care if you're gay, straight, Republican, Democrat, if you're religious, if you're not religious, respect is earned. And, and one of the things that I think that we are missing in the modern age more than anything is respect for one another, respect for people you don't know. When you go out into the world, you need to you need to go out into the world with the mindset when you meet people, you need to earn their respect by giving them respect first. If you give respect, you get it back. 
we now live in a world, I think, of narcissistic, selfish, entitled fuckheads who expect the world to change to be the way they want it to be. I don't know where that came from. My father told me that the world was going to beat me up. He would say, you know, Bobby, when you go out that front door, you got to protect yourself because the world is a tough place. And nowadays, everybody expects the world to bend around them, bend for them. I don't get where that comes from. And that I do not agree with. And I think that to earn respect from other people, you have to give respect to other people. You cannot expect them to respect you first. If you give respect, I don't care who it is. As long as you give a human being, and I think every human being is worthy of respect until they are not, then you can rescind their your respect for them. But I do believe that respect is earned and you must take it upon yourself to offer respect to somebody of yours to get respect back because that's the only way to do it. We, if there's one thing the modern age needs, people need to respect one another. Young people need to respect people that are older. Older people need to respect their opinions of younger people. And we would do a lot better if we would reach out across the aisle and respect our fellow human beings before we expect anything back from them. And I think that's one of the big problems, especially going into an election year. Give respect. Hopefully you'll get it back. But don't expect it unless you give it. At least that's kind of the way. See it. Scott Bartholomew says, always read the novel before seeing the film. Um, I try and do that, but sometimes I can't. It depends if I, it, here's the thing. If I'm really interested in the subject matter, I'll, I'll usually, usually read the book before I see the movie. Like, especially if it's a mystery or something like that, though, like, I'm so glad I saw, or I read the book Gone Girl before I saw Fincher's movie, because I love the book. It was a one-sitter book for me. Same with, as I've said, Project Hail Mary. Um, and they're supposed to be making that into a movie. But but I sometimes, like, I, at eight years old, I don't know if I would have read Jaws first. So I saw the movie, and then I read the book afterwards. I read Jaws 2 first, though which is different than the movie. Um, but I do try and, if I really like the movie, I'll go back. Like Barry Lyndon. I I love Barry Lyndon, but I didn't read Thackeray's book until, or story, story, novella, novel. I have it on the book. It's actually right over there. Um, I read that after. So it depends. I mean, I think it depends. But, you know, for, for uh, you're right. Thomas Logan says, hope for mankind. 10 years ago, the Zone of Interest novel, speaking of novels, almost didn't get published due to its content. And now it's up for five Oscars, including Best Pick, deservingly. Um, absolutely. Zone of Interest is, it's um, a talk about a great movie about the banality of evil. And it's really interesting because that filmmaker, uh, his work is, so he did a Birth with Nicole Kidman, and he also adapted Jonathan or Jonathan um, Michael Michael Faber, uh, Michael Faber's book Under the Skin that Scarlett Johansson is in, and I want to see how much. Um, uh, there's another movie that I'm missing, and Jonathan Glazer did these films, but I'm missing one of his. Let me look this up because he, he did birth, he did zone of interest, he did under the skin, um, and he, sexy beast. I always forget sexy beast, which is crazy. So Jonathan Glazer has only made four feature films. He made sexy beast, birth, under the skin, and zone of interest. And sexy beast has been turned into. There's a prequel series on. I think he's an uh, unbelievable filmmaker, and um, uh, I believe these are all books. I think these are all books. And then he wrote Birth Under the Skin and Zone of Interest. But Zone of Interest is incredible. And for those of you who don't know, Zone of Interest is about a bucolic family that lives this idyllic life in this beautiful house right outside of a concentration camp. So you never get into the concentration camp, but you see the smoke and you hear distant gunfire. The sound design, the movie's incredible. And it, it all it all has to deal with you know, the compartmentalization of, of evil. And it's, it's a tough, tough movie, Thomas, but it's such a great 
film. Such a great film. Um, but you know what? I think I'm going to end uh, this show. I'm going to end the show, and I want to thank everybody for being here. I want to thank Tom Jr. Jackson for being a great moderator. And, um, you know, I want to thank people that write in, even if you write in with controversial political subjects. I want everybody to feel that they can share uh, uh, whatever they want here. I mean, when I say, and I always say it, and I'll say it now early, every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear. I really believe that, you know, and um, I think that's important. And I think here, I like to keep this place here as, again, you give respect, you get respect back. And I think that's, this year more than ever, we have to be able to talk to one another. And the only way that you can talk to somebody is to respect them. And and more than ever in this election year, whether you have diametrically opposed views with someone else, there's no reason why you cannot speak with them. We're all mature adults here. We should all be able to have, and and all of us have common ground. The thing about these channels, movie pundit channels, is we all love certain things, and usually our interests cross over, you know. And um, I I think I think, and I really believe that uh, most of us, no matter who you are, no matter what shape, size, color, creed, sexuality, religion, you know, whatever, I think that most people have common ground, and um, I think this year more than ever. We need to start recognizing that. And you know what? Hopefully, if you give somebody respect, you will get respect back. And, you know, I read, and I actually, there's that British, there's, I didn't read it. I saw it on Instagram today. And, um, and I, I actually put this out on, I forget the name of the comedian, but he's kind of a, he's kind of a very, he's not square, but he's a handsome guy, but he looks pretty, not like a conservative dude, but he's an incredible British comedian. And um, let me see if I can find this because it was one of the great examples. Tom, I don't know if you saw this tweet that I made, but it's one of the great examples of the meaning of life. And I loved, let me see if I can find it because I I sent it out on um, Twitter. It's an Instagram video. And I I probably won't because I always tweet things and... um, if I can, f- here it is, here it is, this is the best, um, and I'll, I'll, I found it, hopefully it'll, it'll show up, it's on Instagram, and it is, um, uh, I don't know the name of the, god damn, this comedian, you'd know him if you saw him, he kind of looks like, um, the actor that's on the new, uh, oh, oh, why am I drawing a blank on his name, but, um, the he ba- he basically makes the point that human life, the fact that we exist at all, the the, the chances of that are incalculable. They're they're um, they're infinitesimal. The, the 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 that we even exist. And he says he'll he will do it. He'll explain the meaning of life in five words. Here he says it. Our lives are about enjoying the passage of time. I've never heard the meaning of life described better than that. Enjoying the passage of time. A physical property of the universe, the passage of time. The fact that we're alive at all and the meaning of life is to enjoy the passage of time. I love that. That's my favorite explanation of what life's all about and that is to enjoy the passage of time. Thank you. Um, I love that. Um... 1001 Johnny says, your advice, Rob, Arthur C. Clarke's Childhood's End, read the book or watch the miniseries first. 100% read the book first. Childhood's End's a quick read. It's a great read. It's very compelling. Um, And it's a thin book. The miniseries, read the book first. The miniseries isn't bad, but the book book has a lot of wonder in it. But anyway... uh, I want to thank everybody for being here. A good bunch. Not not as big a bunch as we had. I know. It's, I talk about Star Trek or Star Wars or anything else. But thanks for uh, sticking around for that article. Once again, I put the article in the description. So check it out. And uh, think about Peter, Peter Benchley tomorrow. And think about Jaws. And um, what does Jaws mean to you? And on that note, 
I already said what I say at the end of every show. Again, thank you all very much for the generous support of the channel via Super Chats and Tips and memberships. And think about it. If you want to be a writer, the Imagination Connoisseurs is going to come this year. I, I think we'll start the contest up probably on Valentine's Day. We'll close the submissions June. We'll announce the winners in August and then send the book off to get printed. So... And I'm going to crowdfund the book because I can't afford to publish a hardcover book. <laughs> so we'll crowdfund it. Basically, crowdfunding meaning meaning people who want it will pre-buy the book. And then all the authors, obviously, would get free copies. Um, and then, and then um, uh, yeah, And I, I, how cool would that be? And so we'll publish a hardcover, we'll publish a soft cover, and we'll publish a digital, uh, like a Kindle version, a digital version you can get. But um, yeah, so there you go. And on that note, I'm going to bed. I'll see you guys later. I'll be back tomorrow. It's February 1st, the 50th anniversary of the publication of Jaws. Go watch the trailer. Listen to Percy Rodriguez's voice. 